I can defend 22 year old me for a second, which I'm not really sure I, I, I care to, he feels like a completely different person, but, um, well, it's not hard to defend. You never got on the court. Uh, 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 (laughs) but, uh, not getting on the court on today's part of my take. We have life episode three. So Ryan Rosillo, Mark Titus life episode three. Great two-hour discussion about everything. We also did a Mount Rushmore of things that are uh, signs that we're getting old. Um, So we're doing a little different episode today. PFT has his dad's memorial on Sunday. So we're taping this, uh, the beginning of the show on Saturday. We're going to talk a little nuggets, maybe a little baby Gronk. And then we will kick it to ourselves with the life episode. And then we'll be back together on Tuesday for Wednesday's show. Uh, today's show is brought to you by our friends at the Barstool Sportsbook, ourselves. So, the Barstool Sportsbook. Download and sign up for the Barstool Sportsbook today. Uh, we will talk about the NBA Finals. It seems like it's over. If you're trying to bet NBA Finals Monday night, I will have a parlay. I won on Friday night. I finally broke through. Uh, shout out Bam for for having those last two free throws. Right now, Nuggets minus nine, over unders two oh seven and a half. PFT, which way would you lean? I'm going romp, Nuggets by seventeen. Womp. Nuggets by it's seventeen. Whomping. Nugs and five. So the great thing with the Barcelona Sportsbook is you can move the line. You can do alternate lines. Nugs minus seventeen plus two twenty. That's pretty nice. So check it out, the Barstool Sportsbook. Download and sign up for the Barstool Sportsbook today. Terms apply. Must be 21 plus. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. So sign up. We'll have a par- I'll have a parlay for the people on Monday night, an exclusive parlay that I'll put together. We're 1-0 in our last one. Download and sign up for the Barstool Sportsbook today. Terms apply. Must be 21 plus. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Check it out. And get involved. Okay, let's go. Welcome to part of my take. Today is Monday, June 11th, and PFT, they tried, they tried, they tried. They tried to give us a series, but the Nuggets are just too good. Friday night, we had a little Scott Foster. Jokic gets his fifth foul on a phantom, phantom foul, where Bam does a great job uh, flopping. They take Jokic out in the fourth quarter with the Nuggets up 10 with nine minutes left, he doesn't come back in for another five and a half minutes, and the Nuggets were up nine when he came back in. So that was it. That was that was me. To to me, that was the moment that the series was officially over. It feels like the Nuggets are just too be- too too good, too tall. Aaron Gordon was too tall, too good. And uh, Monday night, do we have a coronation for your Nugs? I think it's time. Yeah. Well, this is the start of the dynasty. This is this is yes. merely but the first chapter that we're writing with Nuggets. If they don't get three titles, then it's a failure. But yeah, this is um this was Scott Foster kind of passing the torch. The the Nuggets took Scott Foster in the NBA's best shot. Scott Foster might be washed up at this point because he was hired to to extend the series, give the Heat another game. That call was so funny too because Bam took <laughs> took Jokic's arm and then did a false flag attack on his own face with it. And Scott Foster was like, "Perfect, that's exactly what I'm looking for." Boom, Jokic, you're going to the bench, and then uh, Bruce Brown, and then Bruce Brown happened. So yeah. Bruce Brown, Aaron Gordon ended the Scott Foster era. The Nuggets killed Scott Foster. And when you write the legacy, when you write the the history of Scott Foster, you know that it's the Denver Nuggets that killed him. Yes, and it was so. It also felt it was setting up perfectly for the Heat to have a comeback because you had the Jokic foul. You also had um, what felt like the longest uh, delay in game because you had the rim adjustment and then a Heat fan passed out uh, courtside. So we basically had like an entire second halftime that guys were able to rest and like Jimmy and Bam were able to play 44 and 45 minutes and Jokic was out for five minutes in the fourth quarter. It's like, let's just do everything we can to try to make this at least a six game series, but the Nuggets are too good. They are just, they are the, the best team in the league this year. They are the best team in these playoffs 
every time that they've had to answer it, they they've answered it. Like their defense has been incredible this series. That's that's what's winning it. Their defense has been great, and like the Heat in their run to the finals, the Nuggets are able to, depending on the night, find that like third guy who helps out, whether it be Christian Brown on, on in game three or Aaron Gordon in game four. And obviously Aaron Gordon's been good for other reasons this entire series, but his offense like exploded in game four and you didn't need Jokic. Jokic had his statistically worst game of the series and it still was was didn't feel like the Heat ever really had a chance past uh you know like the four, like it, it, they they close it to a five point game at halftime and then the second half it never the nuggets just kept them at a distance the entire time and they are just the better team it's it's what you can't do anything when the when when the nuggets are that much better and that much more talented and they even have michael porter junior who's make make one shot michael porter junior challenge you're still you're still waiting for it he uh he has not done anything offensively and the nuggets still still are that much better than the Heat. Yeah, they've had a group of guys that have stepped up to fill Michael Porter's normal role, which is that third that third banana. And uh, yeah, Nug- uh, even though Jokic didn't have a great night offensively, he still had a pretty good night defensively. I think he had three blocks and two steals, or two blocks and, and three steals. So he, he made a difference on the other end too. And yeah, it's almost like, it's almost like the Nuggets have out-heat cultured heat culture in this series to a yeah. certain extent by having those role players. It's this is Nuggets culture that's winning this. And if you look at like the Lakers, if you look at the Suns, some other, you know, wannabe super teams, especially in the West, that's the difference between the Nuggets and the other teams is that they have guys that can come in and can actually take over a game, just dominate a yes. game if they have to, if the superstars aren't playing that well. And Jamal Murray didn't have his best game offensively, you could say by the numbers. Like he didn't have a, a whole bunch of points. He had a shitload of assists. He didn't have a single turnover on the night either. And the Nuggets shot, I think it was 7 for 12, maybe 8 for 12, on three-pointers attempted off of his assists. So uh, Jamal Murray, like, hey, shame on me for betting against Jamal Murray to get a double-double in game one because I think he's averaging probably 11 assists a game in this series. So he's turned into a different player. He's normally not a huge assist guy, but he's taking what they give him. And, yeah, this is – this is, heat culture's dead. Nuggets culture, viva la Nuggets culture. Yeah, and Jamal Murray also had a uh, floor burn in game three where his entire palm basically uh, was ripped off, and they showed it. I would have cried. I probably would have been out for the year. They did an interview with Jamal Murray, and he said his pain tolerance, he used to do pain tolerance drills when he was a kid. Uh, where his dad would balance hot cups of tea on his quads while he was holding a squat. Borderline, you know, who knows, maybe child abuse, but I would imagine Jamal Murray has a pretty high pain tolerance if he's got hot beverages on his quads squatting as a young child, uh, and now he's about to be an NBA champion on Monday night. You can't argue with results, Big Cat. It it worked. (laughs) Whatever, Whatever his dad did absolutely worked. Uh, Jokic also gave credit to God, shout out to God for helping the Nuggets win this game because he said that this is Aaron Gordon, how he's played in, in these finals and this game specifically is evidence that he's, he's dedicating himself to the game, right? And God recognizes game and God is, is helping Aaron Gordon to win this. So, uh, shout out God. It's tough to beat. It's tough to beat God. Not even Scott Foster t- can take the big Al- man out. Altitude and God. That's a one-two punch on your side that that you really can't overcome. I Aaron Gordon also. I mean, we we have this reminder all the time in sports, and we're still stu- too stupid to like internalize the reminder and remember about it. Like Aaron Gordon, similar to Andrew Wiggins last year, time and place. Like the Magic, it it wasn't you know it wasn't the best situation. He was still good, but now he's surrounded by a ton of guys where he can get the most out of his talent, where he can do the things that are he's best suited to do, and he's completely flourished in these finals. Mm-hmm. But yeah. we'll still I, call him a bum if he was if he was, you know, on the magic. That's that's just bust. what sports fans do. Yeah. Yeah, he's a bust. He's an absolute bust. Yeah. Sometimes guys that get picked uh that get recruited highly, that get picked highly in the NBA draft, we forget that they're actually very good at basketball for the most part. Yes. It's very hard yes. to fool very every good. single scout out there. Although Wimbenyama has somehow done it. But um, I, I did watch this game with my mom last night. I asked her for one takeaway from the game uh, because she does no ball, as, as she's demonstrated in the past. She said that Jokic's haircut, or Yoke Yoke, as she calls him, uh, she said Jokic's haircut 
is a positive move for himself, but more importantly for the team. She thinks that his team plays better now that he's gone. It looks like a number two all around on his head. It, yeah. He looks more aerodynamic, and she thinks that the team feeds off that as well. So Mama Cometer, again, nose ball. I, I'm just so excited to see Jokic with the Larry O'Brien trophy on top of a horse at some point this summer. Because that's yeah. coming. Well, in we the parade, in the parade, yeah. they should they should have him in the chariot behind the horse that's pulling the entire float. Yes, no, no, no engines in the parade. That should be no. the rule for the for the Denver Nuggets. It should all be Jokic's horses. horses. Yeah, all horses. It, I, I was I was a little scared during this game when it looked like Jokic might have twisted his ankle in the first half. Yeah, that that to me, I, there was a lump that did develop in my throat at that time. And then he just goes to the locker room, gets it taped up. He's he is not a horse because if he was, they would have brought the tarp out. It's also um, Jokic turning his ankle. Obviously, you know, you don't want to see him injured, but what I mean, his vertical is going to go from what, like three inches to, to two and a half inches. I feel like he could play mm-hmm. with, with two rolled ankles and still be the best player in the world. Yeah, for sure. It's not like, like his, his, yeah, it's his, not like his, his game is explosive, you know, jumping. It's not based on elevating that much. He goes he goes <laughs> yeah. laterally more than he does. He gets like wider as the game goes on. But he's uh yeah, he's a he's a tough dude. Came back, yeah. played well. Do we know do we know what happened with that Heat fan? Because I wanted to get some jokes off about it during the game. And when they brought the stretcher out, I was like, maybe, maybe I'll wait off on uh on on firing these takes because it looked at, at first like they were treating her because she was drunk and helping her to her seat. Then they wheeled her off on the stretcher. There were a lot of heat culture things I wanted to say at that point. I think she yeah. was just hammered. Yeah, she looked hammered. There was also a fan getting escorted out like while this was all happening by the cops in the lower screen. And we had Jokic, who like I, I loved when he he tried to fix the rim himself by just hanging mm-hmm. on it. And he's like, no, I got this. Don't worry. We don't need a delay. I'll just I'll just put my weight behind this side of the rim. Didn't actually work. But yeah, the um. I, it I, sucks I loved because at that this point, series, Mark Jackson was like, "Let's just play." <laughs> like the the rim yeah. was definitely tilted, and Mark Jackson was like, "To me, this feels like a waste of a, of game time right now." Yeah, if the rim's actually tilted, they they should probably fix it, Mark. Yes, yes. Um, this series, yeah, it's not. It won't be the most memorable NBA Finals, I'd say, uh, because at least the last two games, we've been kind of waiting for the Heat to do something and come back and even this series. And they haven't been able to, but the Nuggets are just that good. The Nuggets deserve all the credit in the world. They are they are such a good team. And I actually like here here's a take. Game two was actually exactly what the Nuggets needed to to do because Mike Malone, we talked to Windhorse about it. He ripped into him. He was able to get them refocused. They hadn't lost in a month. And uh now you're seeing how good their defense is when they're all locked in. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to to reading the oral history of the team dinner at Jeff Green's house in Miami before Game Three. Yes, that's going to be yes. fire. When, the, when that, that's that's when everything turned around for this Nuggets team. They needed to be they needed to be shaken up a little bit at home. Just give Michael Maloney an excuse to dog cuss you for a little bit, and then yes. you'll be fine for the rest of the series. Um, all right, I have before we get to the life episode, I have a rowback question for you, PFT. Rowback dot com promo code take. 20% off uh, your first purchase. Q-zips, polos, hoodies, joggers, shorts, everything at Roback.com, R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com. Promo code take, the best, most comfortable clothes in the world. Uh, do we have any takes on Baby Gronk? I So our, our colleague, uh, Kyle Bauer, uh, KB, KB No Swag, has actually been on the Baby Gronk beat for about two years now. Uh, and, but baby Gronk has reached critical mass this past week. He was on TMZ, New York times had a post on him. The whole thing feels bad. The dad is, yeah. it feels, it feels bad. He's risen up everyone. He's in everyone's DMS. There was a quote. He, he, this is the power of baby Gronk. And when I say the power of baby Gronk, I, I mean the power of baby Gronk's dad, who is maniacally trying to make his 10 year old, a celebrity. Uh, he said, quote, I can reach anybody. Donald Trump's son's wife follows my son. It's bigger than people think, and it's only getting bigger. He just got posted on TMZ today. It's probably one of the bigger things on the internet as an influencer. He could be bigger than Bronny James, who's going to be playing in the NBA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To answer your question, Big Cat, do I have a take on baby Gronk? All I know is that baby Gronk rizzed up Livy Dunn. And he, yeah. is he the new Drip King? That's my rowback question. Is Baby Gronk the new Drip King? Uh, it is. It feels weird. It feels very, very weird. 
Uh, I was talking to Big T about this the other day. He's also he's a, a baby Gronk aficionado, you could say. Um, this dad belongs in dad jail. There should yeah. be a there should be a dad jail, a, a, a jail that's specifically designed for fathers who are screwing up their children in front of the world for everybody to see. And this guy should a hundred percent be in there because listen, as somebody who was approximately five foot eight when I was I don't know. 12, 13 years old, and then didn't grow from there, there's a good chance that baby Gronk, he's not going to be huge. And when he, when the dad's talking about his son, like he's going to be the face of the NFL, face of college football, like, dude, he's 10. He's 10. <laughs> and there was a quote that he said where he's like, no, but my son, baby Gronk, is built different. He's committed to this. He eats a diet of salmon and brown rice like he's a dog. Like, like basically, like he looks at his son like he's a Siberian husky. He's like, I feel I feed my son a raw a raw meat diet. Basically, you remember in Little Giants, um, Howie Long's kid. Yeah, where it's like I massage his legs with with calf milk every single night to to get his legs strong. That's what he's trying to do with Baby Gronk, and it's not going to end well. It's it, definitely it, not going to end well. But he, but to be fair, he did riz up Livy Dunn. Oh, he big time rizzed her up. Uh, yeah, no, it's um, it's the Todd Marinovich. Like we watched the whole story unfold. Uh, why this is a bad idea? It's also football is the one sport where it probably doesn't matter trying to get like all this skill when you're ten years old because. If you're not big and strong and fast, none of it matters. You know what I mean? Like, it, their football is a lot of like genetics and who you are as an athlete versus like playing baseball and being like, oh, I could, you know, I could hit a, a baseball when I was two years old. Like, if Baby Gronk isn't big and fast and 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 tall enough, it doesn't matter if he's really really good. Just like you said, like it it won't matter. It, mm-hmm. His career will will not go any further than than high school football. Because that's just how football works. You need to be a certain size to play in the NFL or high level Division One football. But he is getting he's getting scholarship offers uh, from all these places. I don't think that's actually a fact. I think his dad. I, I'm pretty sure his dad just buying all the jerseys and helmets and being like, "Baby Gronk loved his visit per, to Purdue," and it's just they're probably mm-hmm. in their basement in front of a green screen. Uh, but yeah, he is the Riz King right now. We'll say that he's the Riz King. He rizzed her up. He rizzed her up. And then he even gave her a side hug. So she went in for the real hug. Baby Gronk mm-hmm. gave Livy Dunn the side hug. So that, to me, tells me he is he's the new drip king. Um, the, the offers that he's getting from these schools are definitely 100% not true. I do believe it, though, when, like, LSU offers a baby that's born in Louisiana and the baby weighs, like, 15 pounds – and they give that baby a scholarship offer like 18 years from now. I believe it when that happens, but I don't believe that baby Gronk has any offers right now. Although I will say James Madison University, I would like to offer baby Gronk a scholarship to JMU. If you want to compete in the Sun Belt, like what better place to get baby Gronk? Put him in the fun belt, baby. Should we sign him to an NIL deal? Pardon my cheesesteak. Baby Gronk NIL deal right yeah. now. If he wants I don't to really want to feed into strong, this. <laughs> <laughs> I, here's what I'll do. Here's what I'll do. I will allow Baby Gronk to eat part of my cheesesteaks. Oh, I like that. I like I'm allowing that. it, but I'm not. I'm not giving him any product. We're not shipping him any merch. He's not speaking on behalf of the brand. But he is. He's the only ten year ten year old in America who I am authorizing to eat a constant diet of nothing but part of my cheesesteaks. Okay, so Baby Gronk, you're signed up for an NIL deal with with part of my cheesesteak, and uh, good luck a to lot you. Of people, a lot of people are telling me, like, because I, I, I was talking about Baby Gronk the other day. I just can't give up, get up the fact that he, he did, in fact, riz up Livy Dunn. Uh, people were saying that Baby Gronk could beat me up. That, not a chance in the world. I would beat the shit out of Baby Gronk. Like, if it was one-on-one, me and him in a cage match, I would make him tap. It'd be, it'd be so easy. Though. I know I could beat He's up any different. 10-year-old in the world. Any 10-year-old in the world. Um, That's not true. No, There's it is. definitely... No, that's not true. Think about uh, Habib when he was ten wrestling bears. Like yeah, there's would, some ten years ten year olds in like Dagestan that could whoop your ass. I'm talking like actual ten year olds, not not the Daniel Monte of ten year olds. Any legit ten year old with a birth certificate. I've seen enough. I know all the tricks. I they don't have the experience when it comes to fighting. They haven't seen somebody fight dirty yet. So I would no. I would beat up any ten year old of the world. Um, okay, last thing before we get to it, it also is perfect that we're doing this life episode when we talk about things that make you feel old because just the headline, Baby Gronk rizzed up Livy. 
Um, <laughs> that right there just makes you feel as old as possible. Where I, I thankfully knew what they were talking about, but I would imagine there was a lot of people who saw that headline and they're like, "What planet am I on? Did yeah. I get a? Did am I in a coma?" And I just missed like the last fifteen years of culture. <laughs> the, the dude that made the TikTok, TikTok though is, I think he's doing it satirically. I think he's a funny guy. He is, and, and he, he was is. like, "How many titles do you think LSU will win with Baby Gronk?" Yeah, will Baby Gronk <laughs> lead LSU to a national title? Sound <laughs> off in the comments. Um, all right, last thing. I feel like Zion Williamson's girlfriend might be going too far. I'm ready for her to yeah. stop tweeting because uh, it feels like fat shaming at this point. She was she she posted a picture of him lying in bed. She was like, "I hated sleeping next to your sweaty ass." Uh, said that he just had Coca Cola bottles all over the all over his uh, bathroom. I it's now turned where it was like, "Oh, he's on blast," and now it's like, "Okay, let's we get it." You know, Zion maybe cheated on his girlfriend or his girlfriend's girlfriend or whatever is going on here. Let's move on. Let's not just let's just not drag him through the mud every single day for the rest of time because you want to go viral every day. So uh, there was that one tweet that stood out to me, which was your bathroom was filled with soda bottles and cans. No <laughs> wonder you fat as fuck and not in shape. Fuck you, Zion <laughs> Williamson. I'm tired of being nice. You hurt me and humiliated me. That's mean. That's mean to say. If a man has has soda bottles and cans in his bathroom, that's not for you to put out there on blast. The stuff that women keep in their bathrooms, by the way, is way weirder than the stuff than, yeah. than having like I don't know, like a, a two liter of Sprite in your bathroom. That's normal compared to some of the lotions and face stuff, like seven drawers that are filled up with different types of beige powders. That's weird. That's weird to me. Having a having a a, a two liter of tab in your bathtub. That's normal. That's just guy stuff. You want sometimes you want a nice cold soda when you take a bath. So get over yourself. It's also the very definition of me thinks the lady doth protest too much because what? she's she's claiming that she's done with Zion, but all she's done for the last four days is just tweet at Zion Williamson the entire time. She's mad. She's big yeah. mad about this. There was the, there was a reply to that tweet that was just like, and I I don't know if this is true, but in this case it is true. It was just women are are like suicide bombers. They'll go down, but they're taking everyone with them, and that does feel like she's like it's flipped where she's trying to take down Zion, but she's taking herself down with him. Like she's well, just looking as petty as possible. I, I so I disagree. I think in this case, like all publicity is good publicity if you're a porn star. So she she recognizes that well, she's no, no, having no, no, a moment no. right she's now. She's not a porn star. Where people are she's not a she's not a porn star. She was a porn star. She hasn't done porn since 2019. She wanted that on the record. Well, there's a there's certainly a lot of videos that she's putting out of herself naked for not being a porn star. <laughs> that might just be only. Can you just fans. retire there's from a it? Big difference. Can you, re can you retire from the yeah. game? Do you, what do you do? You just you, you hang up the strap on and you're like not doing this again. Yep, it's it, put it in the rafters. It's time to time time to move on. Uh, but yeah, the, the, it definitely uh, has a vibe of like, hey, maybe maybe just take a day off of just like completely sewering Zion in the streets every well, single moment that you're awake. In a weird way, it's making him more relatable. The, the more that yeah. she talks about it, because she's very very clearly upset. She had feelings for Zion, or else she wouldn't be doing this. But she's she's just keeps going after his weight, and she's like, I barely even came credit to Zion that what a what a compliment like if if a woman comes out there and and her public trashing of my sex ability is like I barely even nutted that's a huge win for me massive dub yes yes um okay let's get to our life episode we have an awesome awesome two hours with Rosillo and Titus we're gonna cover it all we're gonna do a Mount Rushmore it is brought to you by our friends at Game Time, the exclusive ticketing partner of Barstool Sports, created by fans for fans. Game Time is a ticketing app that makes it easier than ever to score last minute deals on tickets to sports, concerts, and shows, and they guarantee the lowest price. There's a ton of concerts coming up. I miss Dead and Company, and it, it Wrigley had to get back to the family, but I'm going to probably see them at City Field uh, June 20th, I believe. So go to Game Time. You can get tickets to sports, concerts, comedy shows, everything 
It's possible with the Game Time app. The biggest last minute price drops can be found on the seats you thought you could never buy. The purchase process takes just two taps and 10 seconds. And once you buy your tickets, they're delivered directly to your phone. No prints are needed. The app also allows you to easily share tickets with friends via text. So you can get into the game seamlessly, skip the hassle, enjoy the moment, download the Game Time app, or go to the website, enter your email, redeem code PMT for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Download the Game Time app. Enter code PMT for your twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Game Time best deals out there. The exclusive ticketing partner of Barstool Sports. Okay, here it is: a Life episode three with Ryan Rosillo and Mark Titus. Okay, uh, it is Life episode three. We have Ryan Rosillo, Mark Titus, Mark Titus show, Ryan Rosillo show. Two huge narcissists that name their shows after themselves. Uh, we are we are remote this time. We will do another one, uh, all of us together. Uh, I'm running out of kids, by the way. I'm done with kids, so you one of you guys is gonna have to step up um, for the next one. But, how do you handicap? How do you handicap that race, Dan? As you look at the three of us, oh. who's the who's the first of us three to have a kid? Mm, I could see PFT doing it as a bit. Yeah, I think <laughs> it'd be Titus, very funny. Yeah, Titus, I think you are definitely like you will have kids, and then yeah. Rasillo always is like, I wouldn't be shocked if just one day he called me. He's like, "Hey, so I'm having a kid. Like, just decided I wanted to have a kid." Well, he's got Chris Paul. Yeah, that's true. Which we haven't talked to you, Ryan. All playoffs, we've given you your space. Do you want to before we talk some other stuff? There it is. The the sixty one. Chris, Chris Paul book. book. Is that how many playoff losses he has? Mm. That's cool. It's about his grandfather that died. Oh, God. Oh, shit. oh yeah, that's right, oh. where he made the final foul shot for him. I remember that. Yeah, okay. Now I feel like an yeah, asshole. No, funny joke, though. Funny joke about the playoffs. No, that's good. Actually, we're taping this show because my dad died, Ryan, and so mm-hmm. we're gonna. I'm going to be going to his memorial service when this airs, so I bet you feel bad for making fun of me for making fun of you. I don't. Fuck. What, uh, <laughs> where are you at with Chris Paul right now, <laughs> Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> is it almost worse ryan that we haven't had you on the show to berate you about chris paul it's 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 that sad now where we felt bad no, even going you there guys, no you guys are just like political zealots on twitter like if if trump fell you know it's, the people would freak out and then biden falls and it's like no it's actually not that bad and <laughs> it could be the other way around if somebody defended trump i'd be like no it was that bad he's super uncoordinated have you seen his golf swing but like chris paul it proved the phoenix suns needed chris paul so then you didn't have me on so i knew exactly what you were doing you guys are frauds when it comes to the topic but it's great to be here <laughs> wait but they went <laughs> we're off to a hot start who this did they great. they won two games with chris paul in the lineup right and then he got injured and then they lost the rest of the games what how that how that shake out well yeah because devin booker and kevin durant both turned into michael jordan at the same time so um but i think when it all was said and done it was they really could have used his playmaking and escape valve and some good decision making mm. and all that kind of stuff but that's cool no i get it i get it yeah we're running out of time with chris paul do you feel that yeah, no, that's that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all running out of time? But to Big Cat's original point, I would I would say Titus. I think Titus might be yes. the next to to become a dad, just because you probably have very athletic sperm. Super I I, athletic. I think between the three of us, I probably won it the most too. But I don't know if that works in my favor or not. I don't know because I I I, I want to be a father. Like I definitively want to have kids. Um, and it's something that I think like I need. Like I think like the older I get, the more I'm like. I I feel like I've kind of done, um, I've done all there is for me to do, and it's like I need to to now be a father and like you know try to live through my kid, I guess, or whatever. Like enter that next phase of my life. Um, but at the same time, I have the I have the thing where like I don't want to do it until I'm ready, and I also know that I will never ever be ready. So I, I right. feel like I'm gonna be like in my 60s, and I'll look around and be like, okay, uh, now I'm ready. And whoever my wife is will be like 58 and she'll be like, yeah, so about that. Um, <laughs> we can't, you know, uh, so I don't know. I, I don't know. I, It'll be interesting. I do think Ryan is a sneaky good bet just because um, he had uh, he, he does obviously life advice on his show, which is phenomenal uh, on every episode. And there was one where he went on a, a long tangent about a kid playing in the sand with his dad. Uh, and like the whole time I'm like, dude, this is. You want a kid, just like you got to have a kid. So I think if he just sees one more kid playing in the sand with his dad, he's going to just find a surrogate and be like, I'm a dad now. 
He just kidnaps the kid. Yeah. <laughs> just fucking <laughs> just takes a kid from the beach. He's like, I'm a dad. Yeah. It's really weird though, because people don't like guys like me just hanging out at playgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, no, I just love watching kids playing sandboxes. It's not a big deal as they're escorting you away. Do you think you'll be a dad, Ryan? I think you will. I don't know. I mean, I think I I would uh, – look, I really actually like kids, you know. Like my sister just had uh, a baby girl last week, and you know, she FaceTimed me, and – the baby did not stop crying for 20 straight minutes. But the lesson in that is that I stayed on the FaceTime for 20 minutes, even though it kind of sucked. Cause I was like, I just, I think being the oldest of five, I, I get it a little bit more than, you know, I know it's no one understands what it means to be a parent. I got it. I've seen your posts, but, uh, it doesn't like none of that ever bothered me. Like I, I knew what it would be. I knew what the sacrifice it would be. I knew kind of all that stuff, I guess kind of to Titus's point, like it's a stupid thing to wait around and say, I don't want to do it until I'm ready. Cause you're never really ready. You just sort of do it. Um, there's a lot of things in life that you're just not ready for. And it's like, well, who cares? You have this opportunity to go ahead and do it. But in this case, you're actually fucking with another person as opposed to maybe taking a job before you're ready for it. Uh, I, I know for a fact, for me, it was like, okay, I'm going to get all these things in place i'm going to be like a turnkey house that you buy everything's going to be turnkey and there's no such thing as that turnkey thing so then like another 10 years went by so yeah we're kind of getting down to it i definitely should be last out of the group i should be last but i i don't entirely rule it rule it out um you know i'm not the same age as pacino but when i saw some of that <laughs> news i was like <laughs> I, you know, I just think that's a disservice to the kid. Like, hey, what was my dad like? No, it's know, the, it's it, the, it, the kid is what is Pacino? Eighty two, eighty two. De Niro's seventy nine. Seventy nine. You basically are having a kid where you're guaranteeing that uh, the moment the kid is aware of life and death, that's when you'll die. Like, you're. It's not even <laughs> like right. it's not even you'll die when the kid's three and he'd be like, oh, I never really knew my dad. No, that kid will be like eight and be like, like my dad's my superhero. I understand that he's old and then he dies. Yeah, because I remember like college that first weekend where we all get there like three days before everybody else, that freshman thing. I mean, it, that is like being born all over again, right? You just dropped into it. And then you'd see somebody be like, dude, is that guy's grandfather helping him move into his dorm room? And then you'd be like, no, that's his dad. Like Pacino is going to be 100. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's such a messed up thing that biology does where where women stop having babies. Probably what fertility 40s. drops off about 45. Yeah. Uh but men, you can you can get somebody pregnant when you're like 110 years old. Yeah. It's stupid. 110 would be old, but like imagine Pacino with a couple milk crates walking behind a guy at like 98. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is also it also is crazy like how city to city when my first when my son was born, my wife was 34. And in New York City, the doctor literally was like, uh, "Like, you know, how old are you?" She's like thirty four, and, and the doctor was like, "Oh, teen mom," because because New York City is like, <laughs> <laughs> like thirty four is still young in New York City. You see a lot of people having kids at like forty one kid and being like, "All right, that's it." <laughs> what an, what incredible material from that doctor! Yeah. That guy's pretty comfortable with himself in his practice, though. Huh? Yeah, he was shooting. He was he was feeling himself. The the opposite is uh, obviously true in middle America where um, everyone's just pumping out kids and getting married in their 20s. And uh, if you're like in your 30s and you're single with no kids, that's part of why I moved to L.A. was like I sort of started feeling out of place when you go to all your friends house and they have like three kids running around and you're you don't. I actually funny enough talking about like being a dad. I had a house in Ohio. I lived in the suburbs because uh I, I don't, I'm an idiot. I don't know. Like I, I, I did the college thing. I wanted to own a house. I wanted a yard. I just kind of wanted to like fast forward to the point of my life that my, my parents had, you know? And I was like, uh, I wrote my book and I made a decent amount of money from that. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. At, 20, at, at 25 years old. Thank you to everybody who bought that at 25 years old. Uh, I'm just going to buy a house in the suburbs. I'm going to do it. Um, and so along the way I decided that I wanted to like, I, I lived next door to a guy who uh, him and his wife adopted a bunch of kids and they had like four kids that they had adopted and they were great people. And um, I became like, Def, it definitely sounds creepy the way I say it, but I was like the neighborhood, like uncle almost yeah. like where all the kids would like, just like, 
th there would be kids like knocking on my door that wanted to go TP their friends' houses, but <laughs> their parents wouldn't let them. So they were like, "Will you go buy us toilet paper?" I'm like, "Yes, absolutely, I will." And I would go buy them toilet paper. Uh, but along the uh, uh, along that path, along that journey, at one point I looked up and I I saw an empty house. I knew my neighbors had adopted these kids, so I went and I asked them about it, and I was like, "Hey." Uh, I don't know if I'm ready for this, but like, I think I want to be a dad and I, I might like look into adopting a kid. And he just immediately was like, yeah, no fucking chance, dude. You're a single dude living in a house. By your <laughs> it's like, it's like, there's no world in which they're going to let you adopt kids. Are you insane? And, I, and then the dream died. And I was like, okay, cool. All right. Never mind. You just wanted like, a friend. Never yeah. Yeah. Did you have any friends around at the time, Mark? Yeah. Um, but that was like, as I got to like 30 years old and I was looking around, I was like, I don't know what's next for me. Like, should I? try to be a dad. I don't really know. Like, so I asked this guy, like, should I adopt a kid? He was like, fuck no, they're not going to let you adopt a kid as a, a single man. Are you, are you nuts? It, what? So you can, so you can kill the kid or have sex with it. Yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. what, what, what were you going to like, say your qualifications were for adopting the child. If you were to go talk to him, be like, watch me shoot a jump shot. Yeah, I can teach. Sure. I can Hulk make. Rider. I can make this kid into an NBA yeah. player. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't really like necessarily. I, I felt like a. It was a weird thing. I don't know. I was just having like an identity crisis, I guess, because I didn't really feel like I wanted to do it. It just felt like a, a social responsibility, almost. Like I had this huge house. Um, it wasn't that big. I don't know. It was like I had like four bedrooms. You know, not to brag, but it was also. Middle Good of nowhere, Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're, it's, was it because your uh, neighbor was like running up the score in terms of karma points? Kind of. Yeah. And they've got, yeah, four, was, they're like the best person on earth. Brad they, Pitt and Angelina. Yeah, Bradley. they adopted four kids from, from struggling families. And then you're like, I, I should do something like that. Yeah. Well, I, I looked into, I asked them too about like fostering kids. I was like, is there a way like we don't make this permanent? Like, you, can I wait, just. Wait, you thought, you thought as a single guy in your late 20s, 30s, <laughs> that any, you would pass any of the screening of this? I did. Yeah, I did. I did. I, well, cause I didn't. So you were, you were legitimately looking into adopting a buddy. No, a no, 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 no. This is like the, it's wasn't, a, there, wasn't a this a movie? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> Was this no. right around the time that movie no. came out? <laughs> no, 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 It's not I, I Love You, Man, is it? It's no, the other it one. Was, it was. Wins? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I've known, I, I've known, I, w I knew I wanted to be a dad at some point. Uh, I, 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 I like basically hit the fast forward button on life too fast. Like I basically, and it's kind of funny as I look back on it, like I live in my thirties and my twenties. And then now as I moved to LA and like I'm in my thirties, I actually feel like I'm living like a twenties lifestyle out here more. Um, but I, I wanted to like fast forward my life. I think, I think I was just like, I got a fucking house I, everywhere. I look like all, all the other dudes in the neighborhood were just talking about their kids and like, kind of like, that was like kind of what the, my point, the, the whole reason I brought this up was just to speak to like the societal differences of the coasts versus the middle America where like, I just felt like a pressure where I looked around and I was like a single dude with a house. And I was like, I, I'm a fucking weirdo in this neighborhood. I need to change that. This is role and models. I, I, role I, models. I, yeah. It's role and models. I dabbled, I dabbled with the idea of like, do I need a kid? Is that what, well, and then ultimately uh, uh, common sense prevailed, and I was like, "No, I just need to sell my house and move to Los Angeles." Well, I think that's, this is actually a good, <laughs> this is a good jumping off point because it was actually something that was asked a lot. And I, I would say, like, to wrap up the kid conversation, it, it is what Ryan said, or yeah, Ryan said, like, you, you keep telling yourself, like, "Will I be ready?" Um, I don't think you ever are. It just, you know, sometimes you just got to bite the bullet. And also, people who are like. You know, kids are the best. It's the best. It is the best, but it's also fucking hard, and it's a lot of work. And anyone who does the social media being like, you know, only fun times, like they're just lying to themselves. Uh, but I, I honestly think that a lot of people are scared off of having kids because of how many people say like. So a lot of my friends, and I'm not talking about you, Big Cat, because you've never said this to me, but a lot of my friends are always talking about like how hard it is yeah. to have a family. Yeah. And because I think if you're a if you're a person that doesn't have kids. And you hang out with someone that has a family, that's their escape time from their family. Right. So they unload all the bad stuff, all the stress onto you. And then that can make you not want to have kids right now because it's like, well, this person is just miserable. Right. Like all the time. So sometimes the other side kicks in where it's not like I don't think of having a kid as being like, you know, nothing but great times. But I've seen more of my friends who are just like unloading on me yeah. all their stress. But yeah, it'll happen. It'll happen when it happens for all of us. No, if but it, it doesn't. That's cool, too. And I would say for people who, like, you're hearing the worst whenever someone says, like, oh, it's the worst. It's never one way or the It's never the best, like, all the time. It's never the worst all the time. It's basically having kids is essentially you, every day you're waking up with a person who has a personality change overnight, and you don't know if one day they're going to be the sweetest kid or one day they're going to want to hit you in the nuts. So it's just, like, it's more like, 
just you kind of just I, I'd say being a, a dad, you roll with the punches better than you ever have in your life. Like it just it's all just like one song. It is. It's just like, ah, it's all right. Like today he sucked. Tomorrow's gonna be great. Today my daughter did this. Tomorrow she'll do that. Like just all one song. It all rolls together. Yeah, I don't know if you want to do this because if we're transitioning this a little bit later on, but just because, you know, I'm the oldest one of the group now, which was weird because I think we brought this up before. Like I was always the youngest of the group and now I'm just like, oh, you're the oldest of the group. You just are uh, by sometimes a pretty staggering gap. But, you know, we get life advice emails. We get life advice emails all the time where it'll be like a dude late 20s. Maybe he's even late 30s. And he goes you know, I could get engaged. I've been with this girl for a long time. We get along, but like you can tell, they just stop having sex. Like there's, there's less passion in the email than there is in the relationship. Right. Cause the guy's like kind of opening up to us in the email being like, I don't really know what I should do. I guess I could get married. I guess I could have a kid. I guess I could do these different things. And then there's a bunch of the audience and I'll even have, you know, close friends. I'll have casual friends that will be like, I, I you know, either the email will say, should I pull a Rosillo? Or the friend will like, I had a friend reach out going, you're the only one that didn't buy into the lie. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> He's like, my house sucks. My wife doesn't talk to me. The kids are a fucking mess. And like, by the way, I don't know anybody that should be selling the idea that having kids is easy. Right. Because uh, it, because it just isn't. And it's actually the most selfless thing that you can do. You know, I always feel like I'm speaking for myself, not anybody else, because, you know, everybody has their own reasons behind it. But like, I feel incredibly selfish in a way that sometimes I have a hard time thinking about. But like, are you actually going to be this selfish, uh, selfish about it when so many people before were selfless and brought another life into the world and all these different things? But then people see me and going like, hey, maybe I could do that. And I'm like, dude, do you think this is the answer all the time? Right. Now, granted, like my college room. Roommate, one of my college roommates came by and he came to the house and you guys have been here and he's out in the balcony. He's looking at the water and he's going, so what are you going to do today? And I was like, I don't know. He goes, you're going to do literally whatever the fuck you want. Right. And I was like, yeah, pretty much. Like I probably play hoops. You know, I'm like, I don't know. I, there's something on a little bit later tonight. I was like, he goes, but you could go golf right now. I was like, I, I could play 36 if I wanted. And then he's like, can you have a boat? I was like, yeah, I have a boat. He's like, and where is it? I was like, it's right over there. It's like 10 minutes away. He's like, so you could just get on the boat. And I was like, yeah, I could just get on the boat. And he was like the most depressed I've ever seen him. Because he just like looked around. And I was like, do you want a drink or something? He's like, no, nah, I got to go home. He's like, I got to go home. I, gotta go. I was like, what did you think I did here? And he's like, I just didn't really get it until I came to the house and then saw. And he was like upset. He was, he was like physically, emotionally rattled from the whole experience that I was he was going to leave and I was going to be able to do whatever I wanted. So I think what happens is sometimes it'll, I don't feel like I sell this as like the answer to everything. Cause I'll admit, you know, at ESPN, I was still nine to five gym and then whatever else I was doing. Now that I live here, I don't even go anywhere. Right. <laughs> like I, the most social I've been in a month was I said hello to three people at the gym an hour ago. So when there's people wondering, which is a very common lesson in this, it's not specific to what I'm talking about, but the grass always being greener. Yeah. Like there's a lot of dudes that look at my deal and be like, that's actually maybe what I should have done. Like, yeah, it's the grass is greener. I'm doing it and I'm telling you it's not for everyone. I would advise against it. And it actually is pretty selfish. It, so it's there. it's a good point too, because so one of the first questions that we had um, that someone wrote in was basically like, uh, I'm coming up first year my big boy job after college he hates it he can't see himself doing it for 30 to 40 years he's happy with his life outside work but doesn't love his work and all this stuff he's right out of college and it's similar to what you just said in terms of I think there's and I really do I don't want to sound like super old but I do think social media has fucked everyone up where you just always think that someone is always having way more fun than you and everyone's just living their life and being able to say like what I have is pretty damn good and not always putting yourself up against your coworkers, your friends, people you see on Instagram. If you can do it, it's liberating. I would say my, my favorite, my favorite thing about Rosillo is that everybody is convinced and there, there's, there's no in between whatsoever. Everybody is convinced that you are depressed and living like a miserable life alone. And you're like a recluse and you hate everything about yourself or that you had lived the sickest fucking life ever. And they're so super <laughs> jealous. And like, I would love to be, res and, and everybody is convinced of like, and they're all looking at it through their own lens right. and how they approach yeah. their own life. 
And then, and then, like, see, like, I have buddies that'll argue about it, and they're like, I don't know, man. I don't know how he does it. Like, he's alone so much. And, like, he, he, the guy just sits there and watches random-ass NBA games. Like, go out and fucking live your life, man. And then other, you know, my other buddies, like, all the things you said. He's got a boat, dude. He lives in Manhattan Beach, and he's, you know. This guy's got it. He's either, he's he's got either it worthless or he's got it all figured out. Yeah. And there's yeah. no in between. There's nobody that's and, like, you know, I'm sure he's figured out a good balance in his life, and I bet at times it's not as fun, and other times it is. There's no in between. I, I, it's always like this is the most sick thing ever this sucks I, I love the idea that the phrase pull to Rosillo could mean two completely opposite things yeah <laughs> yes. the best thing, it's like aloha it means yeah. hi and bye <laughs> yeah because like um it could, it could you know, mean, yeah. there, there are times like i'm okay with it like i i know what i signed up for but like everybody that loves having their family and loves coming home especially the kids are at the age before they just decide to automatically hate you once they get to those years and then it sort of sucks because then they have to go through their own shit and then realize like how great of a dad you may have been right it's all very predictable but those younger moments when you come home and you had your bad day and your kid loves you no matter what and is so fired up to do something with you there's not really anything that you can do to replace that by not having uh by not having a kid but you know when i (laughs) when i think about like (laughs) People going, like, Brasillo has it all figured out. Like, like I'll admit, like, I, there's there's this woman at the gym right now, right? She wears literally nothing, and she's probably almost 60, but she's in pretty good shape, right? Every other dude with, like, a full head of gray, gray hair, like, 10 years older than me, you know, or no hair or whatever, the guys that don't have a wedding ring, they all hit on her all the time, right? I am not attracted to her. Okay, I'm a little surprised she wears as little clothing as she does. She still looks pretty good. But to me, she's incredibly old. But when I see all these old dudes lining up to hit on her, I'll be like, that's going to be you, dude. (laughs) 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 Or if I see an old guy like having dinner by himself at a bar bitching about the Dodgers and no one fucking cares. And then he tells a story about Oral Hershiser like renting a cabin near him. <laughs> I'm like, that's going to be you, dude. Yeah. So I fuck with myself regularly <laughs> and kind of laugh more than I do get. Like, if I got really bummed out about this lifestyle, okay, I'm not telling you I'm like peak happiness every single day. That's just the way I am. It doesn't matter what the fuck I was doing. All right. But if I was that bummed out about my deal, I would have changed it by now. Right. And honestly, yeah. it was more about it was that was more about Connecticut. Because Connecticut towards the end, I go, like I've joked about this with Big Cat. I'd sit in the basement and count how many days in a row I did that deal. And like I remember I think I the records were 59 straight days or 61 straight days in the basement where I ate down in the basement and watched basketball. And the, back then too, I would just East Coast, you'd go to bed earlier, so whatever. Um, that was something I had to break. I was like, we need to move on from this, Mm -hmm. uh, because this isn't working out. So even look the worst day in Manhattan beach, like I'm not going to fucking complain about anything here. So, so to that guy's question and Ron, you kind of hit on this a little bit where he's talking about hating his job and saying, okay, my life is good outside of my job. One year out of college, one one year out of college. Like my, my, my life might be okay. Well, which one is I just graduated college. Recently moved to Manhattan. No, that it's person. the hey guys, long time listener of your pods. I'm coming up on one yeah. year, my first big boy job out of college. Yeah, so he kind of hates it, but his life is okay outside of work. I would say that what if your job is so bad that it's affecting your happiness, it's bleeding over into your outside life. That's a pretty good indication. Yeah, it's time to move on. But a lot of people are are happy in their personal lives at a job that they're not in love with. Right, and that I happen, and that's that's okay. And I also think, and this goes for. And I I hate like giving advice because everyone's got to live their own life. But when you're 23, you're dumb. And I think about how dumb I was and thinking like, oh, I hate my job. And then you look back and you're like, well, it wasn't that bad because then you get more, you know, you, you, you do other things and you get more jobs and you realize like at 23, you just don't know. So you also you also fall into the trap of thinking everything's permanent. Right. And you think that this job that you have at 23, when you say like, this is what I'm going to be doing for the next 30, 40, 50 years. That's not what you're going to be doing. You know, like you might hate this job, but like if you even if you stayed at that company, I don't know. Again, it, maybe I'm off base, but just speaking of generalities, uh, you're going to like move up. You're going to progress. You're going to find like different avenues and different jobs where like suddenly you unlock like a level of you're now like middle management at your job and like you're like i don't really hate this anymore and this is actually i'm more suited for this um but yeah the idea of like the first job you take 
most first jobs everybody takes suck ass. Right. That's like that's like part of the corporate world. Is like when you're when you're fresh out of college, you get the shittiest jobs. And you know why you get the shittiest jobs? Because you're new at this. And the people that have been around for a while have earned the right to move on to what's next. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with PFT. Like sometimes. It, like as long as it's not bleeding over into your personal life and like making you miserable in that aspect, sometimes like your job is a job and you just do it to, to make the money so you can go enjoy your life. And I think to your point, big cat earlier about like social media has kind of ruined a lot of people. I think with work, uh, th- it feels like a lot of people think that like their job should be their identity and that, um, you have to like have a job you love or you have to like, you know, cause all of us do a job that we, we, we probably, we, we, it's not always the greatest thing in the world, but we kind of have an easy job, you know? And we it's, love, it's the best it's, job it's, ever. It, it's a great gig. Yeah. So I think there's like a pressure. If you, if you observe like people on social media too much that you're like, I, I need to do a job that I love, do something you love. And then you don't have to work any day of your life right. and all that sort of thing. Um, but sometimes it's like, man, just punch the fucking clock, get the money, go home and like, just cut it off and go enjoy your life. And I don't, I wouldn't recommend doing that for 40 years, but like in this little phase you're in fresh out of college, as you're trying to figure shit out and you are a dumbass, as big cat said, um, that's, that's what I would say is like, this isn't permanent. Yeah. This is like part of the transition period of your life. And, and, and fresh out of college, it's like, it's even less about what you're doing per se. It's more about like who like, do you have someone who's teaching you well? Do you have, like, a boss who's, like, being a mentor? That's way more important than, like, yeah. learning actually, like, oh, I'm, I'm you know, figuring out this skill and this profession. Like, someone who's teaching you life lessons, everything. And also what you're saying, Mark, like, our jobs are the best jobs in the world. I think we all would agree we have the best job in the world. But if you hit, hit us with true serum, we could give you a list of things we don't like about our job because every single job has those things. So I would say to someone like that, Like, make a list of what the negatives are and ask yourself, is this a negative because it's this specific job? Or is this something that I'll probably find to be negative about work in general? Yeah, I, I, yeah, right, exactly. I would right. also say that it's it's important if you have a job that you think sucks, it's important to have a job that sucks that you're good at because then you can take pride in, in whatever it is you do. Like, I would much rather be good at my shitty job than be awful at what some people would say would be a good job. Yeah. Yeah, feeling accomplished. It takes a little bit of the sting out of like that that feeling that you get sometimes when you come home from work and you think to yourself, "What did I just? What did I do all day?" Yeah, you know, and that's when it starts to bleed over when you actually don't care and it it, it is affecting your at home life. If you're at least good at your job, then you you have a sense of accomplishment. You feel some pride in what you did. You feel like that day is not wasted. So, it, yeah, most twenty three year olds, you're if you have a job that you're good at that uh, pays enough for you to live and get by. That's really all you can expect when you're 23. You're not going to own the world. And you're, wh- wh- you're not going to step right. into uh, you know the job that you're going to have for 40 years. Your career is going to take twists and turns. You'll change companies. You'll probably change your interests. You might even pick up like a completely different line of work along the way. Nobody stays at a job for 40 years anymore. Maybe our, our parents might have. They were probably the last generation to do that. I would be surprised if if that becomes a thing that ever happens again, where somebody gets into a you know they get into the mailroom after college and they work their way up to be CEO. That's just that's not the way that people do business anymore. Also, I'm a big Ryan. When did you? When was your first radio gig? First on air gig was 2002 with the Trent Thunder. How old but, were you? You know, I I I was 26. I got the job when I was 26. I turned 27 that summer. I didn't even make it. I don't even think I made it until 27. I was gone halfway through the season. Um, but I asked that but, I asked that because like I didn't start doing this till I was 27, 28. Same with PFT. Same with you. Mark obviously had a little different because he wrote a, a book, not to brag. But I do think there's that, my house. that feeling my house. when you first. How did that kid buy that house? <laughs> book deal. Book deal. <laughs> when you first graduate college, there's a feeling like it's permanent and it really isn't like your 20s are the perfect time to fuck up, to figure out what you like to figure out like, okay, I can transition. If I don't like this, I can do this. And it, it really, nothing is permanent in your twenties. It really is a time where you can make mistakes and, and like a uh, wasting a year at a job you don't love or two years, you still will get something out of it and you'll find out what you like and what you don't like. Um, yeah. I mean the, the whole, Hey, I got out of school and I have questions about this job. Welcome to fucking life. Right. bro. Okay. Right. So big cat nailed it. 
if we wanted to do two hours on what we didn't like about awesome jobs that we all have and lucky enough to have done as well as we've done, we could do two hours. It'd probably be one of my favorite pods ever to do, <laughs> but uh, that's just life. And the, and the weird thing about that lane, and this actually speaks to like Titus a little bit, like you, you get the book money, you, you're, you're getting a little shine at a very early age. And then you're thinking like, I want the picket fence. I want all these things. And you're conditioned to think immediately after this phase of your life where you're having fun, you're playing college sports. I have to, I have to be a grown up. Like, I think I know you a little bit that I could see you retroactively being like time to grow up. I had a really good friend who was a year ahead of me at UVM. He got a teaching job, stayed in town. He was only 22 years old, dude. And I was 21. And I was like, Hey, let's hang out. We're going out Friday. He's like, can't do that anymore. He was 22. <laughs> that can't was, do that anymore. That was, yes, that, that's, <laughs> right. that's basically what I did, yes. He is in a – he was, and you were, for whatever reason, I'm not even knocking, you were in a hurry to get to that next phase, like mentally of where you were supposed to be at. I would advise against it. I also was not in a hurry. I prolonged it. I stayed there a lot longer. But the problem with this stage of your life – and you may not even listen to me right now, young 20s, mid 20s or whatever, because I don't know that I would listen to somebody who was in his 40s. I'd be like that fucking guy who's talking about shark gills and has a boat and fucking no family like fuck him. Um, I didn't want to listen to anybody. I don't know that I was capable of listening to anybody. But the point is, is you right now in your early 20s, you have no other frame of reference. Right. You've li you haven't lived through anything else. Oh, no way. Shit isn't awesome all the time. You just went from like, yeah, you were, what what pamphlets were you right. reading? And it is also I, fucked up that you go from for a lot of people their college experience, 4 years of like the greatest like it's basically Disneyland for 18 to 22 years. It's the best olds. time of my right. life. And it's it's those 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 years there and the years after, I'm telling you like I'll drive around a song will come on. I'll think about a moment. Yeah. And I get like weird. I'm like, God, you still miss this so much. <laughs> and so, you know, despite whether or not, you know, before college, if you had a tough deal at home, you know, there's plenty of adversity that we can name. But for a lot of people, that first like, hey, this isn't fun all the time. Right. <laughs> there should be a <laughs> like, I, what what'd you think it was? Yeah, there should be a halfway well, I, I, home for people that, that are getting out of college to yeah. like transition to I the love real this world. I, I think that there's a market. So I was moving my mom into like a, a senior living facility about a month and a half ago. And she loves it. And the place kicks ass. I'll be honest with you. It's got restaurants. It's got bars. They're always hanging out with each other, playing card games, shuffleboard, walking around. They're having a great time. There needs to be more of that type of facility just for normal adults, like especially, yeah, well, especially right out of college. Like, Give me a place where it's basically my dorm again, and you, maybe a company even runs it, and then they give you shitty jobs at this company. You live on their giant campus, and they provide everything else for you. I think that would... There's there's a business model out there if there's a uh, an industrial CEO that that feels like this could we could do some sort well, of Well the, the the reason that would be valuable if I can defend 22-year-old me for a second which I'm not really sure I I I care to he feels like a completely different person but um Well it's not he, hard to what, defend you never got on the court. Ah. Uh, uh, that's good. <laughs> that's well joking. But uh Two and a half not getting boobs. on the court <laughs> Led to me writing a book. Yeah, that's true. That's which bought true. me a house. four bedroom house. And almost a kid. <laughs> right. And almost a kid. <laughs> almost a kid. If only. What's, the, yeah. What's that on Zillow right now? Do you ever double check it? I have. It has gone up in value since <laughs> I've sold it, and that'll that'll kill you. Um, but uh, I, I think uh, one of the. So, so guys, between the, when you graduate college and when you're about 30, I find that to be uh, the period of time where most men seem to, at least like that I experienced, when dudes are like reaching out to me. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know, like they're saying like, you know, you struggle with mental health, you struggle with this. Can you help me? They always seem to be in that age range. And I, I think just based on my experience, part of why it's always like guys that age is because, uh, up until you graduate college, you have such a structure in your life yep. and you have people telling you where to go and what to do and when to do it. And yes, when you're in college, you party and you, you know, you let loose a little bit, but you still, you have to show up at the 8 a.m. class every so often or else you get kicked out and then all the fun goes away. So you still have these structures. And then when you get spit out into the world, uh, I feel like there are two types of people. And th there's the one type of person that's like, thank fucking God, I have no handcuffs now. I get to be my own. I get to live my own life. Do I want to uh, go go abroad? Do I want to go? Like, I can go do whatever I want. I can move to any city I want. Um, I can take whatever job I want. If I don't like that job, I can quit. And some people feel the sense of freedom with that. I felt the exact opposite 
which is why I think at 22 years old, I was such an, I was in such a hurry to build some structure, which was like, I need to, I need to grow up. I need to grow up because I need like these societal benchmarks to dictate like where I need to go. Because if I don't have that, I'm going to be lost at sea, just wandering, trying to figure out what the fuck I'm doing with my life. Um, so I rushed into it for that reason, but that's what I, I, I think like there are two different types of people. And I think the people that are more like me are the ones that freak out because you're like, ah, shit. Now what do I do right now? I have nobody to tell me where to go. Um, and you panic a little bit. Yeah. And it also a couple things. One, everyone's freaking out to themselves. You know what I mean? Like that's the, that, that is also part of it is like that guy's got to figure it out. I guarantee you that guy's probably sitting there freaking out for some other reason. Like, the, and by the way, it's good to freak right. out. It means you want something. It means you're holding yourself to a standard. So keep yeah. going. I'm glad you brought yeah, it up. It's just like it, it's the feeling that everyone else has their shit together and you don't. Everyone else is walking around looking at you thinking the same thing. And that's just that you have to remind yourself of that simple fact that it's hard to do, but it really is the truth. That everyone is is dealing with their own shit, freaking out, doesn't like some part of their job, doesn't like some part of their relationship, where they live, whatever. Everyone has their own. No one has the perfect life. And even if that person does exist, they're a fraud because they're they're basically Gary V and they're fucking you know telling everyone to go to their their conference every year and, and pay a hundred bucks. That was a shot at Gary V. I don't know. I think Dan Bilzerian's got it. Yeah, Dan Bilzerian. He's got it. I like Gary V. Down but yeah, anyone who says that their life is perfect is 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 lying to you on social media. Or like that that guy that thought he was able to bend time being like each day is three days. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Wake up. Like stop watching those Cold guys. Tub. Like yeah. I watch, like as somebody that, you know, is now successful and I see those dudes, I, I can't tell you how hard I laugh. Being like, you guys are so full of shit. Right. You're just, you're, it's not, it doesn't work that way. Like, I, I'm glad you brought up kind of that, that beginning time. And again, I still think the frame of reference, because you don't have like, when you're in your 30s, you can compare it to your 20s. When you're in your 40s, you can compare it to two other decades. You know, you're in college, you're a fucking kid with a, a utility bill now. And you're supposedly an adult because you, your name's on a utility. And it, 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 isn't, it isn't true. And so all of the uncertainty, all the... Uh, all the stuff that happens, that cocktail of, of lack of confidence, you're right to point out that it's normal. And I also think like when you're in that early phase, I had the long list of all the things I didn't want to do, but I didn't know what I did want to do. And nothing has ever happened for me in my life, whether it's the beginning, whether it's getting to ESPN, whether it's leaving ESPN, whether it's being in LA and pursuing all the other things, is that the hardest part is doing all the work that shows no results for years. Yeah. Right. So like if you're 25 and you're at some job and you've been there right out of college and you're like, I'm not sure this is me. First thing is no problem, because as Titus said, and PFT, like it isn't even just our parents generation as the last generation. Like most of my friends have 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 moved and adapted to whatever's happened with business, especially the guys on the financial side that always feel like they have to kind of stay one step ahead of it. Sometimes it doesn't work out for them. But if you're in a spot where you're going, oh, this isn't for me. Dun, 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 dun. All right. Okay, cool. What are you doing to prepare yourself for that transition instead of being at a point where it's forced transition? Yeah. And that's, I think, the thing you always, that's the thing that I think is really lacking for anybody. Like, all right, you don't like your deal? Okay. What are you doing? What are you doing in your spare time to prepare yourself for having options when your deal becomes untenable, like you cannot show up to work anymore. We get emails all the time. Oh, I get this pit in my stomach when I walk in. When I had to turn the corner and walk into a bar that I was still at, that my friends were coming back up to for our fifth year reunion, I was going to be behind the fucking bar at my own fifth year reunion. My stomach hurt so fucking bad. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't. And I had to feel that way before to actually motivate myself to go, what little things are you doing in your spare time to get you ready for the change that you know you want to have? And I think for so many people, it's hard to do all the shit that feels worthless and isn't going anywhere because it's paying zero returns. Um, but I tell you what, it's way worse to have not done any of that yeah. stuff and got zero returns uh, and then be like, oh my God, I'm out of work on Friday or I need to quit and I have no backup. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a very good point because uh, to the original question where they're talking about how they hate their job and they might feel like they're wasting their time at it. There might be parts of your job that you're doing that are very, very important for whatever step you actually want to take next. Or as Ryan said, in the job yeah, it, or it, like, outside, yeah, like yeah. BFT, tell your story again, because like what weren't you selling siding or something, but you were also like thinking about all the stuff that you wanted to do. Right. Or it was used. Phones? It was used, used dogs. dogs. Right? So yeah. I, I mean, I, I've sold a lot of things. I sold uh, portable air conditioners, 
tankless water heaters, used dogs, used cars for a while. That was my first Christmas job trees. out of college. Christmas trees. Van Pelt sold pagers. Pagers. Yeah. He sort of stuck around in that industry. Just like dealing with drug dealers all the time. He's still got stock options. He doesn't know <laughs> if they're going to invest or not. Yeah, he's, got, he's one of those cricket wireless trust fund kids. Uh, I, I did, I've sold a lot of things. It did teach me about human interaction. There were a lot of parts of it that I hated. Uh, actually, most of it I hated. But you do learn small interpersonal skills. You learn how to break ice with people pretty easily. And there's certain things that you pick up, even from a shitty job, that you can then transfer to whatever it is you want to end up doing. Or like Ryan was saying, if, if you're working, if you're behind a bar, you might feel like, oh, shit, everyone's judging me because I'm working you know, in, in our, our small town bar, uh, I haven't gone anywhere. But if you're taking steps outside that towards whatever that future goal is, then your job is not a waste of time at all because it's, it's an investment in allowing you to pursue what it is you want to pursue 5, 10, 20 years from now. So just because you feel like you're wasting time, there are certain things that you can be doing to make a job that feels like a waste of time actually a really good investment in, in whatever it is you want to plan down the road. It's 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 back to Titus's point where you're in college, there's structure, and it's like, okay, you, you take the class, you take the test, you get a grade. In, in jobs, like, you, you know, you might get one-year review, but there's a lot of things that you're learning that you don't realize you're learning until way after where you're like, oh, shit, that was actually pretty important to, like, who I am as a person now. And it sucks because there are times – I remember my first job, I was getting paid $30,000, and I went my first raise after the first full year. I had already rented an apartment with all my buddies, sick place, way over my budget because I was like, I'm going to get a sick raise. My raise was $1,500, and I was just like, wait, what? <laughs> like, it didn't even show up in my paycheck. It was so low. And it's like – but, like, it, it just kind of was like, all right, yeah, because guess what? Times are shitty right now. It doesn't mean you get, like – just because you worked for a year – doesn't mean you get some huge raise. You don't just keep giving it to you. But the things you learn along the way, like, become part of who you are. I also, for the for the guys who we're talking to, the other piece of advice I'd give is when you're in your 20s, work, work, hard, work long hours and party long hours. Because you will get to a point where you can't, like, physically do it. Like, I, I think about, you know, even the start of this show when, when PFT and I were both – uh, like 30 years old, like still in like that, like it was just every waking minute we were just pushing as hard as we possibly could. If you asked us to start it again right now at 38, we wouldn't have that same ability just just on a pure like energy level. So just know. It shows in the episodes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just know that like you do have. I mean, we're doing life advice for the <laughs> what fourth year in a row? <laughs> yeah, right. third, third, right. third time, four Ryan, years. Ryan, you're, yeah. you're the best idea that we have for a guest right now. That's um, how much we're ghosting. <laughs> but you will have that moment. <laughs> you will have that moment where you're like, shit, I don't, I don't have the, the gas in the tank to do everything I want to do as hard as I was able to do it. So do it very, do everything really hard when you're in your 20s. Yeah, I, I agree with that. When, when I was spinning my wheels at a, at a job that I knew was not my future, the biggest regret that I would ever have at that job would be when I'd go back to work on that Monday afterwards and I hadn't done anything over the weekend yeah. to progress myself towards what I ultimately wanted to do. So, like, yes, I, I definitely partied a lot, had a great time in my early 20s, enjoyed the hell out of those. But I always made sure that there was some time that I was setting aside to actually do some work that would help me on the long term because otherwise you get back to that job that you might hate on Monday and you're like, well, I've made zero progress whatsoever. And that to me was all, that was the biggest waste of time. That felt like that would set me back mentally. And then I would get into a ball of stress, anxiety, and, and back in that position of, oh, I'm never going to get where I want to be. So just have some discipline, you know, party hard, work hard, but also you have to set aside, write it down. That's actually the, the biggest thing that I, I took from my early 20s is if you write down what your goal is, what you want to do, and the steps that you have to take to accomplish to accomplish it. And you say, okay, I've got to spend two hours writing on Saturday. Write that down on a piece of paper, and then you get to cross that off on Saturday, which is a great feeling. And just crossing anything off a list always yeah. feels good. Yeah, it's the, I, the look, A-Rod I, method where he, he has a list every morning. It's like drink coffee. Yeah. Done. <laughs> I drink. I, uh, I completely agree with PFT on that one because, like, you know, whatever stages I was going through and then I got to like really not liking myself phase because I was just so fucking pissed at myself all the time. And 
thank God I was like, thank God that I wasn't cool with myself. You know, it, it was good that I was mad. I look back, I'm, I, I appreciate that anger because it was motivating me to be like, are you fucking seriously going to be one of these guys? Like, is this what you're going to do? Because this is like the path. Like there's not, you can't be 40 and going, oh, what happened? Because these are the moments right now that are defining those moments. And I would do the same thing where like every week I had to have done five things that were going to give myself options later on. Then five things became give it like one full day where from whatever the first four hours you're at your apartment, all you're doing is working on this stuff. And some days, actually most days were pointless. There was almost zero return on a lot of those investments. But then there was that one. And if you don't, you know, the fishing net, like if you don't have any lines in the water, I can guarantee nothing's going to happen for you. But the, the, just the, the idea of potential hope was enough to drive you. So if you're sitting around bitching about your plot in life and you're younger and you're like, oh, well, what about this? What about this? The, the simple question immediately is like, are you doing literally anything to improve your situation? Are you hitting up a friend who's working in industry that you like? Do you maybe just call them? Shoot. I mean, honestly, I signed up for an email service. This is like, again, like early internet days. I signed up for some stupid uh, alert that was giving me classified job links that had anything to do with sports. Honestly, the whole site was a complete scam and a ripoff. But by signing up for it, I was like, all right, did something. You know, I did something today. And you know, the job part of it is I, I'll finish this part real quick. Landing your dream girl in your early 20s, the likelihood isn't going to happen. There are rarities. Um, but landing her isn't going to happen probably because you aren't ready. She might be ready because usually they're more mature than us at that stage. The job thing is the same deal. Like you may have four or five jobs right out of college that all suck. But what the reward will be will be now you truly know what it is that you like to do. Maybe you like to be in the office. Maybe you don't. Maybe, okay, I actually like to do this. I like to get on the road. I don't like being on the road. All these different experiences. And I just think that you're at such a lost stage at that point in your life because you're like, wait, is this it? And you're like, well, no, it, this, it, yes and no is like the answer to both of them. Yeah. Look for a job like you're looking for a woman. Yeah. But you, and if all else, if all else fails, just write a book about being friends with Greg Oden. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> that, that will. You, you you propel your career forward. You touched on something though there, Russell, that I, I do think like it, it 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 sucks. Networking sucks, but it is like it's how the world works. And so like asking your friends what they're doing and talking to other people and, and having those lines in the water will always come back to help you because you'll be like, Oh shit, I do know someone who does this or I have a connection to this and and like keeping those lines always open will eventually pay you back. Even though it does suck. It sucks having to be like and, fake nice and, and you know, like, you know, drinks with someone who you're never going to get a job from and all that shit. But it, it happens. <laughs> it, it does. Like, like it sucks. Networking. Yeah. Ryan, I know you don't like networking. It sucks. But, I'm the worst at it. But it I, helps. I, adm I admire. Like, I'm both. Uh, I, I'll, I'll let Titus finish there. But, like, when I see somebody who I'm like, oh, you're a real Rolodex guy. Right. And, and I'll see, and it'll be like, they'll be attempting to do it to me, right? Like, oh, you're a connector. So now you're actually, it's not about you doing me the favor. It's you looking better that you can connect me to somebody else. And then I'll always, and I despise it, yet still I'm sort of envious of the ability to because I've never been able to do it and I'm going to continue to be bad at yeah. it. Titus. Rosillo and I are terrible at this. Uh, it's it's one thing that, that we, uh, we never talk about because we don't reach out to each other. Um, but uh, <laughs> if we did, if we did spend a lot of time talking to each other, um, but so I would say to learn from my mistake, because this is something that I, I, I viewed networking as kissing ass. Right. And I think it's important for younger people. Um, if you're someone like me, that's just like trying to be jaded and trying to be like, I, I don't know, try like uh, you're too cool for school. Um, I don't, I, I think looking back on it, I wish that I had like a, a slight attitude adjustment uh, and, and didn't see networking as ass kissing, which is like networking to an extreme level, you know? Um, but that was kind of how, like, I was like, I don't want to play that. Why would I fucking call this guy who I don't even really know? And like, why would I go to that happy hour with the employee? Like, I don't really love those people. Like, why would I, you know, and I don't want to come across as an ass kick kisser. And if I have to kiss this guy's ass to get the job, to get the thing, then I don't even want it. Um, but there's a middle ground and the middle ground is like actually being sociable with people and like getting to know people and um, 
Yeah, that's something I wish I learned a lot younger. That like just because you're networking doesn't mean you're now a kiss ass. Yeah, this might be a, a no duh to a lot of people out there that are are good networkers. But if you're a bad networker, and I know I was a terrible networker, especially in my early twenties, you have to understand that networking means that uh, you're not reaching out to somebody and they're not going to wave the magic wand and give you everything that you want. Yep. It's right. it's like you have to care about what it is the other person wants too. And then you have to genuinely be able to help them with something they need, and then they will help you with something that you need. So it's not – you can't approach it just strictly like, I'm going to go to this networking event and get the job of my dreams. You know, you have to you have to look at it from somebody else's point of view, what makes their life easier. Can you help them with anything? In fact, the best networkers that I know, the good Rolodex guys that I know, they are just awesome at proactively hitting me up with something that they know that I will I will be interested in something that could help me out in some way. And then if there's anything that ever comes across my mind where it's like, oh, that would be perfect for this guy, I'll give that person a call immediately. I'll give them what they want because they've done a great job at, at understanding what my motivation is. Yeah, and it's 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 a great point, PFT, because it is like Titus and Rousseau, like it does feel dirty and it looks like kiss ass and it sucks. But if you just if you if you think about it differently where you're just like I'm just I'm just connecting to you know more people and it, it's, it doesn't have to be asking okay. for something it doesn't have to be getting something in return but you'll find points in your life where you're like oh like people will hit me up all the time being like hey do you know this person yeah of course like you know like that that's just how kind of the world goes around what my biggest problem with it and and this is uh I need therapy for it <laughs> is what I, I, I don't reach out to people because uh, I just assume that no one wants to fucking hear from me like that. that And that is that is a, something that I think is a struggle that like if I was to, to you know, like, Dan, if I'm watching Justin Fields, you know, on a Sunday um, and I'm an Ohio State guy. So I, I have a vested interest in Justin Fields being a great quarterback for the Bears. I feel like I should have been texting you last year as this was going on. But I'm also like, I'm sure he's got a million fucking things going on, and I'm sure there's a million people blowing up. Why? Why would I reach out? So like, I would hesitate to to do that at times. And I don't understand. I don't. I've never been good at like getting over that mental hurdle of. Uh, I I really struggle with uh just it, also with like the friends that I have that that play professional sports. Most of them are in the NBA. Um, like Mike Conley is like the nicest guy on planet Earth, and Mike Conley is is a guy that I've known for well over half my life at this point. I know that if I texted Mike Conley, he would love to hear from me. I also like just have this thing in the back of my mind that's like Mike Conley is living a far more interesting life than wanting to hear from fucking me. You know, like Mike Conley's like in, in a playoff run right now. Like, why in God's name would I text him good game last night, bro? Um, they get eliminated. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> they beat the uh, they beat the Nuggets. They beat the Nuggets. People, the l- legacy continues to grow as the Nuggets are, are rolling. They won one game. Mark, you should, um, you should text him. You should text yeah, Mike Conley. No, I mean, you're, you should text him right now. You should text him right now. Text him right now, being like, text, thinking text of him right you, now, bro. Yeah, but do it do it in a cool way that's indifferent. Be like, how's that Nuggets series going? Yeah. So <laughs> Damn, you're Nuggets aware look of what really he's doing, good. but not. Yeah. Um, no, so I, I think against them? that's the that's one of my issues with networking is it's it boils down to like self-confidence, I guess, of just like, what do I, how am I like bettering this person's life? Like how how is them getting a text for me bettering their life? It's probably not, so I'm not going to send it. And that's something I've really, really struggled. Yeah, with, no, you you I'm being completely open and honest. You, I mean, I consider you a good friend, and I don't think there's ever been a text message conversation that I didn't start. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love, and every time you text me, I get excited, and I'm like, oh, it's cool. I get, I guess, I get to talk to Dan now. But, um, I don't know. I it's it's, but then I I get I get the reputation as being you know, standoffish and, uh, not sociable and all that sort of thing. And really it's just like my own insecurities bubbling over. But as it, as it pertains, like I struggle with that with friendships, but as it pertains to like the career side of things, um, I don't know. I just like, don't have that gene in me to like do that. And that's one of the things I'm, I, I struggle with I th- and I try to do better at. So I think one thing that that's helped me over the years, cause Mark, I've, I've felt the same way a lot of my life. Um, just the, uh, the idea that people do want to help other people Yeah, for the most part. So, like, if you had a, a question or anything for me about, like, I know you're going to be moving to Chicago. I don't know anything about Chicago. I don't know why you'd ask me anything. You're way more familiar with the city than I am. But if you had, like, a question like, oh, what grocery store are you shopping at in your neighborhood? Is it good? I would, I would be, like, very happy to reply to that and be like, oh, great. I get to help Mark. 
So you just have to like keep that in the back of your head that your friends do want to help you with things. Don't feel bad about no. The logic, the logic is the logic is completely fucked because when people text me, I do get excited and I'm like, oh, it's good to hear from this person I haven't heard from in a long time. But then like I never think that it would work the other way. Um, but yeah, that's just that's I don't know. We're getting off. We're maybe getting off networking. A no, little bit, no, but that, but was, that was something no, that uh, I think it's it's. I mean, people like to answer questions. Just a too. heads up, keep just keep me off of that grocery thread. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, what PFT said. It's I mean, it's it's like probably the fault of of many men like whenever you know when you get asked a question that you don't even know the answer to and you'll just answer it just like you know being like oh yeah i know this just because you don't want to say like people like to answer a question maybe just start shooting like layups to everyone just being like mike conley like what's your birthday (laughs) oh yeah that's right it is okay yeah yeah, you're right (laughs) it is that how's the family how's the family doing mike Mike, i'm Uh, thinking about uh, buying a car what kind of car do you drive yeah right (laughs) you would love to answer that dude those are the best (laughs) Because then you get to like, yeah, he gets to to be like, oh yeah, I'm driving this sick car. Like the the layups yeah. are people like answering questions like that they know the answer to. Also, That's you should fact. be like, what's up, Mike Conley? You yeah. should refer to him with his full name his when you text him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've I've got a question for you guys um, because we were talking earlier about just like kind of self discovery. We we're kind of hovering around that topic a little bit. I always hear people talking about finding themselves, mm. like. I went for a vacation in Europe to find myself. I went backpacking across the USA to find myself. So went to Montana. Yeah, he went to Montana. Found. I'm not going to say it. Um, but. <laughs> oh, it was. I'm sorry. When, when it comes to finding yourself, that's a concept I've, I've never really completely understood. I think I've always taken it to mean, like, just become happy. Just get happy. I don't know what finding yourself means, but a lot of people spend a lot of time uh, in different transition of their lives, worrying about finding who they truly are. And I don't know what that means to you guys. And it's something that I've been wondering for, for actually like a long time. Cause I don't understand the concept of it. Uh, I, I feel comfortable answering this cause this is something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, I think for me, finding myself, the idea of finding yourself is like more finding your place in the world, more finding out like what it is, uh, what, what is your purpose for being here? What is something for, for me, it was like almost finding something outside of myself more than finding myself. Like, cause what, what is it that, that keeps getting me up and every morning and what keeps me going and all that sort of thing. Um, and I think like you, you brought up like happiness PFT. I think to me, like finding myself was, was leaning less into finding happiness and more into finding fulfillment and like trying to figure out what it is. Um, I, I think those are two very different things. And I, I kind of have honed in on that, that like a lot of the things that I was doing in my twenties and early thirties, um, they were things that did make me happy in those, in like the moment I was doing them, but I would go to bed at night and not feel like I'm fulfilled in some way. And I think like the process of me trying to find myself was trying to figure, which, which kind of goes back to like me saying, I know I want to be a dad because like no part of me wants to change diapers and wake up in the middle of the night with crying kids and like have like a whole nother fucking living being that I now have to take care of. As I sit here today, the, living by the beach in Los Angeles, that does not sound exciting. That does not sound fun. But I know like deep down that is part of my fulfillment process that like, I think, I think that that's what I need to like, feel like my life and my purpose on this earth is like fulfilled. So I, I think that's, that's how I would define it. It's like trying to figure out less what like puts a smile on your face and more of like what makes you feel like a whole person and makes your identity make more sense to you. That's a good answer. Know your why. Marcelo? Um, no, that was a good answer. I, you know, I think it's a really complicated thing to answer. I think we all hope that we're like building towards these places in our own timeline where it's like, oh, once I get to here, then I'm going to feel this way, right? And then once I'm here, I'm going to feel this way. And I think the big joke about life is all that stuff's bullshit. Like the amount of stuff that I thought was a certainty when I was in my 20s later on, I was like, oh, my God, that's that's stupid. Um, And then you get a little bit older or whatever. I I think from I think there's one part of it where it's it's. Hey, I know myself, right? All of us know ourselves better than anyone. (laughs) Okay, if you think about how weird that is, like who knows you better than you? It's well, no one. Because you're the one that has all the thoughts and you're the one that really knows how things make you feel good or bad. And so this, this like this peak of understanding or fulfillment or happiness, like from this point on, I think it's pretty delusional because 
the way it sold to us is that from that point on, now everything makes sense. Or this this point on, everything's going to be easy. It's like, no, you're probably just more conditioned to deal with the challenges because you've already had so many challenges in the past. So maybe you don't get rattled and not getting rattled is actually you finding yourself and being happier or just having a higher low. As it was before, when you haven't had as many life experiences and you're getting so rattled by it because you're like, wait, I don't, like, this is really weird. It's kind of like being dumped a third time. Like the first one may really fuck you up. Second time, you're like, all right, I remember this. This isn't a great feeling. The third one, you're like, all right, look who, look who's single again. You know, like, cause you're just, you've been through it enough. And then the last part on like this finding yourself, um, I don't think I personally am that impressionable. Like, I don't know that I can be, <laughs> maybe gullible's too hard of a word, but I, I don't think I'll ever have a moment where it's like, yep, now I get it. Like, I don't, for me, that that moment doesn't really exist. I know myself now. I know how I react to certain things. I have other goals. I have things I hope that happen. If they don't, I'm much more suited to handle it now than I would have in my 20s because I've already gone through a lot of this stuff. So that that moment, that Xanadu, uh, cool, go for it. I'm not quite sure it exists the way we think it will when we're young. Unless you'd go to like South America and yeah. drink ayahuasca for three yeah. days. And then that, that actually sounds like finding yourself. Yeah. The, it all um, makes sense. Yeah, I don't I, I don't think there's an aha moment either. I think it's just like a slow build I, of of lessons you pick up along the way. I, I think it's um, Right, but the problem the problem with the drug part of it, not to be the anti drug guy, but like in the moment you may feel that way. Right. And then the shit wears off and you're like, oh, Remember when I thought everything was going to be different two days ago? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I that's should go know, taking, like, that's called eating really, mushrooms. Yeah. I should go take that drug again. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, <laughs> could you go to Joshua Tree? Do you really think when you go there that like a couple days after that visit, like everything's fucking different? Yeah. Like that's, that's kind of ridiculous. Like that place would be way more popular. If it had that long of an impact on the rest of your life, although if enough, and it's pretty popular now. If enough people had taken acid in the '60s, who knows? There was that there there was a there was a moment where maybe if enough people had done it, we the whole world would have been different. I I think finding yourself is I agree with you guys. It's not an aha moment. It's a slow burn, and I actually think it's all about uh, like real confidence because you as you get older. You start looking back and you're like, that was totally fake confidence. And then eventually you get to a point where you're like, I'm confident in myself. Like, I'm confident in who I am. Um, and I know when I fuck up. I know when I do good things. And having that, like, real confidence where little things don't bother you as much. And you just know, like, hey, this is how I'm living my life. And I, I think I'm doing a good job at it. And, and yeah, there'll still be bumps. It's not boom, everything changes. Like we're was saying it's, is, is a complete fraud, like that aha moment. But that, that feeling of getting to a point where you're like, okay, this is what real confidence does feel like. And knowing what the fake confidence felt like when you were going through all those changes and being like, yeah, wait, that really what I was kind of putting on a front there. Like I was covering up some stuff. I was, I was acting a way that was not really truly me. And Maybe it's as simple as like, you know, when people are like, hey, you want to go out for beer? You're like, no. I'm yeah, confident I, in myself. I, I, no, I, I'm, I, I'm good. I, I think being confident in yourself is turning inward too. And I think the part of being younger is, as you said, Dan, like having the brash, um, j just having an attitude of like wanting to, to put off a certain aura right. to everybody around you. And you do reach a certain age and it's not an aha moment, but there is like a shift that happens. For me, it was in between 30 and 35, like it started to, yep. uh, which I think who, the guy who came up with the 18 to 34 year old demographic and then 35 starts a new demographic. That guy's a fucking genius yeah. because I feel like something did yes. change. Like once I turned 35, um, I think it's less about like tr trying to solve or, or trying to like tweak your image to the outside world. And you get to a point where you start getting more worried or more focused on like, just when you look in the mirror, what do you see? And when you're going to bed at night and you're staring at the ceiling, like what are, what are, are you good with who you are, right. what you think and like all that sort of thing. And I think that's what finding yourself is, is like you, you ultimately get to a point where you're like, honestly, I might not be for everybody. Right. You know, there are going to be people that think I'm annoyed that, you know, and like I said, I do struggle with that. Like, I don't want to text people and like the outward part of my life is still a, a struggle for me. Cause I do sometimes think that I'm a bother to people and all that thing. But in inward, like I'm totally fine with like who I am, what I believe, 
uh, how much money I make, how famous I am, um, like all that sort of shit. Like you get to a point where you're just secure in it. it and I think that's the process it, of finding it. It's yourself. kind of like there, there it's, it's to a shitty analogy would be like with the confidence thing for the first, you know, whatever, however many years of your life, it's like, you're, you're trying to drive a car really fast. And then you kind of hit a point where you're like, I'm just kind of all in this car. Like I'm just, I'm in the passenger seat. I'm good. Like, w like things will happen. Friends will come. Friends will go new experience. We'll get there when we get there. Yeah, like no it, need to, yeah. You just have a, it, it, again, it, it is not aha. And it does take gradual time. Cause you, you'll have moments in that path where you'd be like, Oh, I really have the confidence now again, probably fake, but you do eventually get to a point where you feel comfortable with yourself and everything kind of floats away a little bit where it's like, you know, you can just deal with situations in a, in, a, in a different way that feels like you just are yourself at all times. Was there a moment for any of you guys? Because there there is no aha moment. No. I, I agree with that 100%. But there are a lot of little moments that add up into making you who you are at any given time. Was there a moment, looking back on it, that you knew was a very important choice or an important thing that you did that you agree like now – that was a small aha moment that built me up into what I am right now. Good question. Uh, uh, one moment that I look back on was when I stepped on the scale and I weighed 50 pounds more than I thought I was going to weigh. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> that every day, of, bro. That's that started, every day, bro. <laughs> that kind of started a, uh, that was one definitive moment. Uh, My new trick, and, and by the way, I was like, just as a sidestep, because I want to hear this story, but I, uh, when I weigh myself at the gym, I'll make sure that I'm holding all like four towels before I go to the shower. So I can Shoes. be like, those are probably each, each like That's five pounds. So I'm good. I knew I was fat, but then, but then I had an idea what the number might be. And I stepped, I was like, it's going to be a really high number. And then I stepped on, it was about 50 pounds more than I thought it was going to be. And I was like, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Shit. yeah. Wait, so how long had you gone from the previous time? Had you just not wanted to step on a scale then? Yeah, I just time? didn't. Yeah. It, it'd probably been a few years, honestly. That's like, crazy. I just kinda, like I knew I'd put on a few pounds, um, but it didn't really fully. <laughs> and then one day I was like, uh, I, I actually got emasculated at an Ohio State basketball event. Uh, I, I got called out for being fat, basically, which like I was totally fine with because it was like all the dudes I played with, and we all bust each other's balls. And you know, that's I, I literally wrote a book, like telling some stories about these guys. That uh, how many times am I going to mention I wrote a book? By the way, on the show? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, don't know, I feel like that's going to be your publisher's going to reach out and go, "Hey, we sold way more." <laughs> <copies."> <laughs> yeah, what happened? <laughs> um, but uh, uh house in the Midwest. Yeah, there we go. I was, I was, you know, I was fine. I was fine with it. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of had made my own bed in that regard. But like, guys were were coming at me and how, about how fat I was. So I went home and I was like, "Am I that fat?" Like, I just thought I was like a little bigger. You know, I thought like after you get done playing basketball, you get bigger. You know, like Magic Johnson's a little bigger than he was when he played. <laughs> like, you know, it just kind of happens. Um, and then I weighed myself and I was like, Jesus. <laughs> So, and then that started that honest to God, like uh, jokes aside, that did start like a, a personal discovery path for me. It really did. Like I started like, like I, I, I am, I, my life is out of control and I just kind of like slowly, I started identifying. I was like, if I can weigh 50 pounds more than I thought I weighed, what other things in my life have I completely lost track of? Like how I'm treating people and, and relationships and all this sort of thing. And, uh, yeah. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that was one definitive moment. I vividly remember stepping on the scale and being like, fuck me. <laughs> this is bad. Yeah. I I have a lighter one. If you want me to go in between uh, Titus and Russell. Was that a weight joke? No, it was not. Uh, I actually think that uh, when I was 12 years old, I was on a family vacation and I won a hundred dollars on a turtle race in Key West, Florida. And I was like, damn, that was fun. I liked that. And I actually probably should look back and realize, like, yeah, that was probably the moment where I was like, I like this. This is fun. Oh, this is the thing <laughs> this I like. This is the thing yeah. I like more than anything else, pretty much. So, yeah, that probably would be the moment where I found myself. I was like, fuck, that rocked. My turtle went faster. If that turtle had been just, like, half a yeah. step slower. Never gamble my life. <laughs> this podcast yeah. would not exist. Yeah. That's, that's the ultimate. It's the turtle effect. Yeah. I also went, so I think good. it was uh, 20, or it was 1994 or 5. I went fifth, I went 16 for 16 in the first day of the tournament and 15 for 16 in the second day of the tournament in my bracket. And I was like, this rocks. Wow. wow. So those two moments probably are the two moments where I'm like, that was awesome. I, uh, I, have, I have a couple. I don't know. 
One's one's a little heavier. One's a little lighter. I'll do, I'll do the heavier one first. Uh, <laughs> Is that a weight choke? Did you get it later? <laughs> You know, one of the things that I, I think is great about the mental health awareness stuff is that, you know, it makes people that feel like they're alone realize they're not alone, right? I think there's also, and I don't know how popular this would be, I think there's also a slight lane where it's like, hey, I'm bummed out, fucking deal with it and get out of my way. Mm-hmm. Where when I was going through my mid-20s and, you know, I, I go from still being in your college town to taking this baseball gig that I was like I, every week I showed up to work I was getting I was broker and broker like it it cost me more money to stay there than it did to actually do the job because they totally lied to me about how the commissions work and all this stuff but I was in my first on air gig and you know back then you needed more than a laptop to just be on the air and so then I proposed to my girlfriend. She said no. So we had a couple things not working out. This is 2002, right? right? The famous 2002 right. year. 02. 02 again. <laughs> yeah. Real historians know. <laughs> I do. And I was really, really uh, miserable. I was sad. You know, I was, I was pretty fucking bummed out, man. I was pretty bummed out. But then I started realizing that I kind of enjoyed being bummed out. <laughs> because then it gave me an excuse to do nothing right? Like, hey, maybe you should start working. No, can't, dude. Like, I'm just not there. And I started being so comfortable with it that I'm at least glad that I I was like, okay, wait a minute. Like, you may not be super happy and get through this, this phase, but this isn't an excuse for everything. It's not an excuse for you to be shitty to your siblings. It, it's not an excuse to like lose, lose touch. It's, it's not an excuse to have your parents like have to fucking cater to every whim that you have because they know that you're hurting right now. And once I kind of realized like, Hey, do you, do you like this? Do you like being bummed out? So therefore you have an excuse. It kind of made me look at myself a little bit differently. And then I'd say the more light one is just being at ESPN and, you know, in the first few years with Van Pelt, they all wanted to replace me other than Van Pelt. They, every time the show was bad, it was my fault. When the show was good, it was, it was because of him. It was absurd on and on and on bad contract offers, all the stuff. Wouldn't put my name on the show. Wouldn't make me a full-time employee. Didn't have health benefits for like the first, uh, I think fucking two or three years on the show. I mean, all of this stuff and everything was designed to try to get me to quit. And so I started, and this sucks when you're an on-air person, you start thinking like, wait, do I suck? Like I'm surrounded by managers that all keep telling me I suck in one version of another. And based on the offers that they're giving me, instead of just being fair and making me a fucking employee, they had to fuck with me at every single turn. And I was like, you know what? I actually think I'm good. And if I stay in this role long enough, I'll still have more, I'll gain more staying on the afternoon show at ESPN radio than I will in anything else. And they kind of know it. It'd be nice if they could just be fair and I could go to the fucking dentist, but no, um, they're not going to do that. But I had like a real epiphany as an on-air person, which I think anybody pursuing the on-air stuff is, unless you're lying to yourself. But there was a moment where I just, and it happened too late for me, but there was a moment where I went, Hey, you know what? I'm fucking good. Yeah. I was like, I'm just good at this. I'm good at this job. Yeah. I'm, I've listened now to everybody else. I've listened to the people that are supposedly 10 times better than me. There are people that are better at me than this. I think this guy's better at doing radio. I think this person interviews. But the collection of what I am now at this point, my abilities, I was like, I'm fucking good. So I know I've, when I show up here, I've, I've got 10 different people looking at me, wishing they could replace me because I'm just not famous enough, which is in a whole other conversation. But once I had that like moment, a real Zen moment of as an honor person or anyone who's performing or writing or doing these kind of things, like once you, now you could also be lying to yourself too. So there's probably some people listening to be like, I think you suck and you're full of shit, right? Because, you know, it's all a taste thing. But for some of the more creative careers, when you get to this like level where you're just so confident in your abilities, and honestly, it doesn't have to just be the creative stuff. It could be somebody who's working in a corporate, but once you're like, hey, you know what? I'm pretty fucking good at this. I think you become even better because now you've like, not self-acceptance, but it's it's this moment of like, 
hey, all the unsure, uh, like the uncertainty of like, am I doing a good job? Am I not doing a good job? Once you stop thinking about that stuff, it frees up all this other room to just continue to execute and be even better at whatever it is you're doing. We're going to get back to the life episode in a second. It's brought to you by Coors Light. It's summertime. It's Coors Light season. I was drinking some ice cold Coors Lights in Chicago this week. The mountains are so blue. I saw some great mountains that people have tweeted me over the last couple of days. Mountains blue on the golf course. Mountains blue at baseball games. Mountains blue at kick, kick out, uh, cookouts. Mountains are just bluer this summer. Just a fact. And everyone out there thinks about the day that they'll eventually get to retire and enjoy all the freedom that comes with it. But who says we have to wait decades before we get to kick back and chill out? Take advantage of that free will. Spend the summer chilling like a retiree and pair those moments with Coors Light, the beer that's made to chill. It's the beer that's made to chill. It pairs well with a retired state of mind. It's perfect for all your summer plans or a lack thereof. No judgment here whatsoever. The mountains on the bottles and cans turn blue when your beer is cold, so you know when it's time to grab another. This summer, chill like you're retired with Coors Light. Get Coors Light delivered straight to your door with Drizzly or Instacart by going to CoorsLight.com slash take. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. I love that. Chill like you're retired. That's a, Being retired is just a mindset. Uh, that's what I'm going to do this summer. This summer, when I'm having a Coors Light, I'm just in the retirement mindset. Nothing can bother me. Mountains are blue. It's time for a Coors Light. Check out Coors Light. And the Life episode is also brought to you by our great friends at Part of My Cheesesteak. If you're tired of sad, limp, and flavorless cheesesteaks, you should be craving something that will make your taste buds dance with joy and happiness. Well, look no further, my friend, because Part of My Cheesesteak is here to save the day. We just opened up a bunch of brand new Part of My Cheesesteaks. I saw part of my cheesesteak might even be in some NFL stadiums next year, maybe some NFL stadiums of teams that we represent here on, on part of my take. Can't wait for that. Don't just take our word for it. Our satisfied customers rave about the delicious menu items. You're not going to regret part of my cheesesteak. It is the official cheesesteak of part of my take, and it's the only cheesesteak that Baby Gronk is authorized to eat. We have allowed Baby Gronk to eat part of my cheesesteaks. Check out our delivery-only restaurant created by part of my take. Enjoy delicious cheesesteaks and loaded fries from the comfort of your own home. I love the Chipotle cheesesteak. The buffalo chicken cheesesteak is awesome. The brownie bites, you got to get the brownie bites tacked on for dessert. Order now at partofmycheesesteak.com. Also available on Uber Eats, Grubhub, and DoorDash. And now, here's more life with Ryan and Mark. Yeah, and I, it, go, going back to what we were talking about with the guy and his first job and all that sort of thing and how like you're you're when you're that young you're working with so few data points i think part of that rosillo is that as you get older um i i almost liken the jobs that we do to being like baseball players where like every show we're we we, we both are all all four of us uh we we talk so goddamn much for a living this is what we do we talk there's so many times we make so many jokes we may have so many takes um not all of them hit some of them are good some of them are bad whatever and i think when you're starting out in in this job or any other job uh when you have fewer data points your first at bat in the big leagues you strike out you're like i suck i obviously i have one i had one at bat i threw a fastball right down the dick and i let it go by i i obviously am not built for this once you've been in the majors for five or six years and you have some things you look back on and you're like, yeah, I had that one great play and this, this and that. If you go through a slump or whatever, you get a bit more secure with like your abilities. And yeah, once you, once you've like convinced yourself, I am good at this, then you can handle striking out five straight at bats, you know, and it's not as, it's not as big of a deal to you. If, if people on the internet say you suck and or whatever, whatever else you have to deal with, uh, because you come a little more secure that, with it all. I don't that, know. No, it's, it's a great point. Both of you like, PFT and I had this with this show. Like, I think if you look at the beginning of part of my take, we structured everything so meticulously and like, then we're going to talk about this and then talk about that. And then we hit a point where like, I, we're good at this and people want to just listen to us, just be friends and talk sports. And it like, it completely opened it up to a, a different show that I think is like great because of that, where it's like, you don't have to, you don't have to have every next step planned. And once you realize, Hey, I'm good at this job. It does open you up to be like, I can do this. And it's a lot of small dubs along the way. Right. Life is about stacking small dubs until until it eventually reaches a point where you do have that baseline set of like confidence that you can go out and get another small dub. Right. You're not going to hit a home run every time, but if you know that you can make contact, back to your baseball analogy, Mark, it makes the ability to hit a home run that much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
going going another aha moment i just thought of was uh i think i've told told the story on this show or i a, a million shows but I'll, I'll do it again here uh van pelt speaking of van pelt um what i it was the 2016 i believe ncaa tournament and i was working at grantland and van pelt uh uh, reached out to me and was like, we're going to do a, a bracket special show at ESPN and we want to fly you in because you're under contract. I, I think Grantland might have been, have had dissolved by this point because I think that was 2015. I think that was Halloween 2015, but I was still under ESPN contract. Did and you Van, have health benefits? <laughs> uh, I honestly, I think at that age, I don't even know if I would have realized if I did or not. I think health benefits <laughs> to a kid that's, that's as young as I was was like, the fuck am I going to do with this? Um, but I probably did. I don't know. I was still under contract. So Van Pelt flies me up. He's like, we're going to do a selection show um, from Bristol. Uh, we want you there. Come it, come be a part of the broadcast. So uh, I I come up to Bristol. Um, I was really excited about it at first. And then I'm, I'm there in the production meeting. And uh, he, he tells me it's going to be, I think it was Jay Billis. I know it was Jay Billis. And I think it was Carol Lawson at the time when she was at ESPN. Um and it was going to be me, and then and then obviously Scott. That we were going to be the four on air talent for this deal, and I only never really... two Duke people. <laughs> yeah, <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> shocking. <laughs> and uh, I I had done a few hits with him at this point, and I'd done a little TV stuff, but like by no means was I a television person or an on air guy or anything like that. And my excitement, like in this pre production meeting or this production meeting, uh, my excitement had gone from, or, or I, my emotion had gone from being excited about the opportunity and like, holy shit, this is going to be awesome. My boys are going to see me on ESPN for an hour for the selection show. To like, holy shit, I am not qualified for this at all. What am I doing here? And Van Pell uh, gave me the best piece of advice. I, I will always remember it. I've told the story a million times, but here's a million and one. Uh, he, he could sense that I was nervous and he just pulled me aside and he was like, hey, man, I don't need you to be Jay Billis. We didn't, we didn't call you to, to come up here and I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, reach out to you to be here to, so you could go out there and just try to be Jay Billis. I have Jay Billis here to be Jay Billis. I want you to be Mark Titus. And if you do that, we're going to have a great show. And it felt like a thousand pound weight just fell up, melted off of me. And I honest to God, I think about that whenever I'm having, even now at 35 years old, all these years later, like whenever I'm having like a bad, you know, self doubt of like my spot and my, my career, like my, you know, like what, what are the podcast charts saying? Or like, what are my bot, whatever. I just take like a deep breath. And I do think about that. And I'm like, at the end of the day, if I just continue to like do what I think is good and I know I'm good, um, the rest of it will take care of itself. So that was another aha moment for me. And we all love Scott. So I thought I would give him a shout That's out. Uh, uh, that, it's interesting to think about because a lot of times you don't think about the impact that what you tell other people, you don't yeah, think about the impact yeah. that it's going to have on them. Uh, but there's so many points in my life that were completely changed by somebody telling me like, Hey, I believe in you. You're good at this. And they, yeah, for, but for, for Scott Van Pelt to not say, I, I want you here because I think someday you might be X, Y, Z. He was like, I want you here. Cause right now I see you as this. I don't know. That was just super it, fucking valuable it's, to me. I mean, uh, now three of our bosses, Dave Portnoy, not a, not a big compliments guy. I don't know if anyone has realized that. But I still remember the only compliment he pretty much ever gave me. I wrote a blog in like 2013, 2012, and he just emailed me, good blog. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm like, oh, so that was good. Okay. And I literally, that that gave me the confidence. So it's like what PFT was getting at, like, it's also pay it forward. Yes. You know, tell other people. Like, I try to do that with guys and girls at the office. Like, if they do something good, it doesn't t it doesn't take anything to tell someone they did a good job. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's very easy. It's not a heavy lift. And it probably means a lot more to them than you realize in the moment. Because even Dave just saying good blog was like, oh, my God, this is fucking awesome. Yeah. Like, if something, holy if, if shit. something makes me laugh, I try to tell the person that was very funny. Yeah. Or like, you're really good at that because that that can have yeah. a big impact on how they feel about themselves. That can change everything. Yeah. Like I, I still remember my one of my big moments in my life was just barely getting into a comedy writing class my senior year of college and i had done like i do everything else i waited to the very last second to fill out my schedule didn't apply for any classes that class was all filled up i emailed the professor his name's inman majors great teacher and he wrote me back he's like i'll let you into this class no problem uh first day of class he asks us to write something we turn in and i was walking out of the room and he goes hey that was funny you're a funny writer yeah and that moment right there that was the only class that I cared about for the rest of my college career that 
tiny little praise that he gave me gave me confidence to be like, well, maybe I, I, I should pursue a career in comedy writing. That changed the entire trajectory of my life. So I always try to, if something makes me laugh, I'll just tell the person like, hey, that was awesome. Good job. And you never know. It's important to pay it forward because you never know what that person's going to end up doing for the rest of their life. Yeah. Do you regret it if you find out the person sucks? No. Oh, getting a compliment from a shithead? Whose car is backing no, up, no. by the way? No, the other way around. Complimenting somebody that you're like three months later, you see a few more. Of their yeah, no, that's, yeah. Ha that's oh, also happened to me. Yeah. Yes, that has happened yeah. to me. And, uh, yeah. and I get shit on a lot for yeah. certain instances of that. And that I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Yeah. yeah Van, after the show, Van Pelt told me you should have been Jay Billis. As it turns out, he's like, you, you should. But what about the? We would have. It would have been a much better show. If I, Jay like if Bill, if Bill Cosby had been like, "Hey, man, that was. I think you're very talented." <laughs> and then you find out like ten years later what Bill Cosby was up to, or you're like, "Oh my god, <laughs> what did? Dude, what that, did he see in me?" Dude, yeah, but then the reverse version of what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Some there was a there was an art teacher somewhere in fucking uh germany or whatever in 1917 was like you suck at painting yeah so <laughs> so maybe if better. he just said like hey you're a good painter things could have been different or maybe the art teacher said i don't need you to be leonardo da vinci <laughs> yeah. i just leonardo just da vinci be, is already yeah, leonardo. Be I need you to be adolf hitler. Yeah. 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 being adolf hitler will be good enough yeah. <laughs> hitler was like, oh, shit. good point <laughs> do you know that when fdr was taking a ship across the Atlantic to set up for this meeting during World War II in Africa, not the one in Tehran, but they did a demonstration out at water and they almost torpedoed the ship that FDR was on from a US sub. Oh. It actually was heading towards it and they had to find a way to detonate it before it destroyed the ship and killed the president. Our armed forces almost killed our own president Holy as shit. he was shipping across the Atlantic. All-time Jimbo right there. I got a fun fact for you that I gave to PFT last night, Rasilla. You like this. Uh, do you know who the first American to find out that Joseph Stalin died? Mickey Mantle. Johnny Cash. Look it up. <laughs> he was in the armed forces. He was like, he was a decoder in, uh, you know, doing Morse code in Germany after the I feel war. Like that's not true. It's definitely true. Go look it up. But I uh, no it, PFT is exactly right. Like that was a great point that telling people just good job and like and getting to a point where you because that also comes back to the whole confidence thing because when you're younger telling someone good job or that was funny you're you're like I'm never gonna do that like then like I'm telling them they're funnier than me like fuck that you get to a point I, where you're like I, give no, give compliments. I, I DM these actresses all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't believe Sydney Sweeney, great job. I can't believe yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like you were so good on Love Island. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Max, you're you're funny. Yeah, you are. You're funny, funny guy. Like, you're you. so funny when you lose. Memes. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Appreciate memes. it. Memes. No, all right. I got some quick hitters for us. Uh, so right, one guy sent a, a bunch of these. Are, these are good. How to, how to balance your friends caring about politics versus not caring about politics? Thought that would be a good one coming up. We're, if you're, we're gonna have a year. Yeah, if where, you're someone who cares about politics. Uh, you should just know that your friends that don't care about politics probably hate you. That's that, a good one. Be, I would, I would say, I would say like, it just like, I don't, I don't know. Like maybe just, this is a good time to split up the friend group or something. Cause like, I can't imagine. I, I like when you sit that to me, Dan, I read it. I was like, I don't, I cannot imagine like two dudes that are like great friends. And one of them's like <laughs> very heavily into this shit. And, and is, is just living on Twitter, firing off tweets about, whatever grievance they have of the day. And the other guy's like, yeah, bro, I don't really care. Like, I can't imagine how those two people get along. Right. So I, I, I think you just throw up your hands and you're like, all right, this friendship isn't for me anymore. That's what I would do. I don't know if I had a friend. That I also way. just, I think it's as simple as just, if, if you know, you disagree that much, just don't talk about it. Don't talk. Like about it's okay it, yeah. to be friends with someone and not talk about that stuff. Yeah. That's true too. Yeah. I've got a lot of friends that I, I disagree with about stuff like that. We just, you learn yeah. not to start. It's not productive. No one's no one's going to change anybody's mind in 2023. Right. It's just we all we all kind of are who we are at this point. Our country's like 49 percent every election. Isn't that fucking weird? Yeah. How you can have two candidates that could not be less alike and they'll always end up getting 49 percent of the vote. Both of them. Yeah. yeah. There's just like two people that live in this country. And if if you don't get along with the other person when it comes to certain things, then just don't bring up those things but also with politics it's gotten i feel like the word politics has changed because now like politics at any given moment 
just means the things that any politician happens to care about at that time. Yeah. And so what might be politics yeah, to somebody is just somebody else's life. So I don't I don't know where to draw the line. Like, what is political? Politics now? just means having an opinion. I also where you're like I I think like if you tell your buddy like I think Embiid should have won MVP and they're like, whoa, dude, let's not bring let's politics. See, let's not be political. <laughs> That's very woke. I also I also <laughs> think that uh, I never <laughs> I never Jokic. understood the people good American who are like I found out one of my friends thinks this, so I had to be, stop being friends with them. Like maybe I'm naive, but I. I don't really talk politics at all with any of my friends, but yeah. I also know some of my friends think differently than me, and that's a good thing. Like, that's a I very good thing. Yeah. I interpret that you're right. I interpreted the question as like, my buddy is super into politics yeah. and talks about it to me all the time, and I don't give a fuck. What do I do? And I'm like, you know, oh, that, you, you yeah. Say, Let's stop talking about it, or like, I guess you just don't be friends with the yeah. guy. I don't know what else to. <laughs> Ryan, when you're getting into yeah, good tax argument. I remember one time I, <laughs> 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 I should have said it. The economy, I said taxes. <laughs> then, I became, then I became the only guy in the country, apparently, that cares about taxes, which is really, I'm surprised I'm not getting booked on more shows. Ryan, when when you invited your friend to go with you on a vacation to Washington, D.C. in January 2021, and then it turned into a big political thing, did that ruin that friendship? <laughs> I remember, I, I think, I think you guys did it too. Like I had already taped the pod that morning and then, you know, usually an hour or two before it goes live. And I tweeted out the link and it was January 6th. It was like, oh, figures that you would release your pod on January 6th. <laughs> and I'm like, look, if anybody, if anybody can tell me that boots on the ground, that somebody goes, hey, Rosillo released his pod. Let's rethink what we're doing. <laughs> If if my if the release of my pod or like hey guys Rosillo isn't releasing his podcast today <laughs> let's let's pack up <laughs> let's pack up and let's go back then I would have done whatever it could have been I think what I look at with all the politics stuff is that I'm I'm actually not very political I think the extremes at both sides like you're such fucking hypocrites because the same stuff that like one candidate would do that you're going to spend all time tweeting about if your guy does it then you're going to defend it it's the same shit as like most sixers arguments honestly so um i i just i don't have really much patience for it. i remember one time i was out to dinner or we we're having drinks with mcshay and one of his buddies i guess is like super political and i barely knew him and there was something about like the killing of Osama bin Laden. And I was like, well, I imagine like whoever was in power would have done it. And he was like, are you kidding me? He's like, Bush said emphatically that. And I was like, <laughs> it was like warming up with 315 on the bench. I was like, holy shit, dude. <laughs> I was like, I just kind of had like a layman's approach. I wasn't read up on it. So I'm not presenting this as fact later on that like, you know, if you had a chance to take out a terrorist, that's probably a pretty high approval rating move. And that probably anybody in office would have done it again I'm, I'm just kind of thinking like out loud of how i was thinking it you would have thought i insulted his wife and the wife's sister and every and it was like lewd like i couldn't fucking believe it and i turned to mcshay I go what what's that all about and he's like oh did you talk politics <laughs> I go, yeah he goes don't he goes don't we none of us will i can't stand it it's fucking brutal i mean look this encounter i think was like 15 years ago and I've still never forgotten it because this was like pre Twitter and all this stuff. I, I guess what I'd ask is those of you that have tweeted about politics nonstop for eight to 10 years or four or two or six, has it been worth it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Like what's changed? Like, this is the, was, yeah. Right. Like, do you look back at all the time on that going Really good use of time. Yeah. Really yeah. good use of time. Yeah. I can never imagine. I could never imagine, unless your sole goal was to have a certain following, because some people have, you know, weaponized a lot of this stuff, turned it into this massive following, then they can pretend that they have some sort of presence when they say, like, featured on. It's like, featured what? Like, somebody replied to a fucking tweet? So... I get that there's a lane there for people that can kind of find their niche with content, but now we're kind of on to something else. I personally would would have to do like a real hard hey we're not doing this like if we want to be buddies and it's not even that I, maybe i even oppose you i just think of this as a topic i'm not interested in and you think that i'm supposed to be yeah. so um all right next one uh underrated vacation destination activities or spots i thought that was good i got a good one yeah medieval times medieval, medieval times. times is <laughs> the best place in the world it is so fun you go there, they give you a turkey leg the size of your torso. 
They give you flagons of ale. They fucking bring you flagons of ale. Then you get to watch knights the beat the good? shit out of each other. Who cares? It might be. I, I, it tastes good because I'm watching a sword fight while I'm eating it. And if it's not good, I just tell myself, wait, this is what food tasted like in the year 1100. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, I'm really getting into this vibe right now. Medieval times is the best place on earth. I'm actually mad at myself for not going a single time to the one out in New Jersey since I've lived in New York. Because I always have, some of the best times in my life have been had at a medieval times. That's a good one. I, I, uh, I'll throw out, I, I, I'm not a huge vacation guy like Hank is. He's on vacation right now. Um, I love going to just pick a city and just no real plan. Being like, I'm gonna walk around this city for three days, long weekend. Done it in a bunch of great cities. Wait, when's the last time you even did this? I did well now with kids, but I've done Seattle, Portland, Toronto. So you just fly, you just, you just. No, well, stay just away. Like, you just no, well, no, like I'll go to dinners and shit, but I'm saying like walking around a with city. With who? What? With my wife. So like, if someone stops, so someone stops uh, you, uh, and yeah, no, and I'm not like, doing it by myself or so. But yeah, so so you're walking around, and yeah. there's someone in Seattle, and they you, you bump into them, you make small talk, and they're like, "Where you're from?" And you're like, "I'm from out east," and they say, "What are you here for?" And you say, "Just to fucking walk around for three days." No, I like I that- go see shit. Are you guys really think this is that weird? You gotta have no, no. no I, I don't think it's weird to like pick a city that you've never been to to, exp- but like the way I think it was the way you. Okay, maybe you, I, I presented it incorrectly. You set it up initially. Okay, like going to Toronto. You know, had a couple dinners planned, but a lot of it was just walking around the city to different neighborhoods, like just get, catching the vibe, like grabbing a beer here, grabbing a coffee here. I it's my I think favorite it's leading, thing to do. It's, it's leading with just walking around the yeah, city. Yeah, okay, that probably is a bad if, way. If, yeah, if you, but I, I, <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I have picked a spot on a yeah. map and said, let me. I've never been there. I, let me go check this. I out. I would highly recommend it. Um, wh- who's who's is beeping? Whose truck is beeping? I'm beeping. What's going on? Is the car getting towed? <laughs> Dark garbage day. Oh, garbage day. Um, no, I, I, because a lot of people think vacation, you got to go to a beach somewhere. I really do think it's like very cool to go see what another city is like by just hanging out in it. And like one of the cool, one of the, one of my most memorable vacations was uh, I, I looked at the map of North America. I picked out, I, I was just staring at it like, where have I never really been? Uh, Nova Scotia looked funny to me on the map. Uh, and I started Googling, like, how far would it take to drive there from Columbus, Ohio? And I just mapped out a vacation. I drove up to, like, Toronto and then to Ottawa and, like, over to yeah. Quebec and, and Nova Scotia. And, like, the whole trip was insane because it was, like, I, I would never in a million years have planned a trip to go to Quebec City or to go to, you know, New Brunswick, like, wherever the hell. I ended. And I was like, this is awesome. And Canada's awesome. Like, I'd been to Canada a few times, but, um, yeah, so to that point... That is that is a good move. That's a good I, move. Just you like, have to wrap it around around some event or something that you're doing there. Like I, I, I could see myself saying, you know what, I'm going to go check out San Diego. Going to go to Padres game. Go see, to the I, beach for a little bit, I, and I'll then just spend up, my time walking around San Diego. Yeah, see, I haven't. Yeah, I, I'll. We've done it and not wrapped it around any event. Like did Savannah, Georgia. Like had a couple great meals, rented a car, drove around. Like it was fucking awesome. Just like seeing what the city is like. On not like a touristy way, but just like kind of being in it. Oh, All right, you, bad idea. Sorry, you guys. know what? You, no, 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 it's, no, it's a, good a good idea. idea. It's a good idea. <laughs> I'm thinking it's a good idea. You just led with you led with. I, I also, like to fly to cities and walk around for. Three I'm days. also realizing <laughs> now that like when I say that like I just show up like I, I I'm starting to realize that like my wife probably planned a lot of stuff that I don't even realize. Yeah, yeah, right, so it's right. like one of those situations where I'm like, this is cool. Like we did all this stuff and it's like how this all happened. And it's like, she's probably planned it all out and I'm just a fucking moron. You know, what? I, I I've done it. <laughs> I've done that before new Orleans. My first time to new Orleans yeah. was just like, let's go to new Orleans, see what it's about. Most of the other times I do it, there is a beach that's nearby. And so it'll be under the, under the pretense of, I'm going to go to the beach in Miami. But yeah. what I really end up doing, you know, I'll spend some hours at the beach, but I'll go around, I'll eat dinners, go see what the town has to offer, check out neighborhoods. It's not that It's not that weird. Like, I did it in Toronto, and I, all we had planned was a few dinners. And, like, we just, uh, like, there was one day we walked probably 15 miles where we just walked through the entire city, and it was fucking awesome. I don't know. It was cool. <laughs> I guess. Right, but you, in the beginning, I know, you I know. kind of sold it I know. like you just get off the yeah, plane Yeah, no, I know. That was stupid. That was stupid. That was right. stupid how I sold so it. So what you're saying is you go places with your wife. Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone else ever done this? <laughs> well, not you, Ryan. <laughs> You've ever, you ever picked out a city to go on? 
Well you ever picked out a city to go on vacation and then gone with a loved one? Uh, all right, I, I <laughs> sold it incorrectly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Paris is a great city to just go to, walk around. Um, I did just walk around Paris. Yeah, I didn't I, go into any I, of the... We went to the Louvre, and I, the line was so long, we're like, fuck this. I did too. The Louvre is overrated. Yeah. That's one thing you can My, take away from this podcast. If you go to Paris, go to go to Musée d'Orsay. <laughs> Don't go to the Louvre. Fuck the Louvre forever. Uh, my favorite vacation I've ever taken was to Alaska to uh, Denali National Park. So I, I would I special shout out to that. That I, I've I've done a lot of the nature trips, um, a lot of the uh, national parks. I've hit a, I've hit most. Of, actually, behind my shoulder uh, for my background is like all that's that I, I can't point. I can't, I'm stupid. There it is. Um, a lot of the national parks I've been to. Uh, Denali was awesome because it was like the one place where you're you just feel like you're on your own. They take one bus in, they drop you off, and they're like, "If you die, you die." Figure it. Like we'll we'll bring one bus through here to pick up whoever survives. Um, and that was awesome. So uh, not to how go long? All, how many days? I did a full week there. Not to go all Chris McCandless on you, you know the uh, Into the Wild guy that uh, died in the bus. Um, but yeah. That was pretty fucking awesome to just be out there and like to have those moments of because a lot of these national parks, they just like pave a parking lot and you see people in like designer jeans that are like walking around like as you're you're trying to be an outdoor rugged, you know, like diesel. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Ryan? Also under like Hawaii is I, I know this now. Hawaii is the one place I've been where everyone I thought overrated it and it was underrated when I went. I was yeah. like, holy shit, yeah. this place is incredible. No, Hawaii, at least I've been to Maui a few times and uh i would say most places i've been lucky enough to travel a lot after a while i'm like all right i got it maui is one of those places where when you go have to leave you're like i don't yeah i don't really feel like leaving um so uh, my big thing's role play that's why i go alone <laughs> because i'll just stay in a village whether it's switzerland france italy and i may just go out one of those nights and pretend i'm a completely different person and I'll just look a little stressed out. I'll have a attache with me and I'll just ask if anybody's seen the ambassador. <laughs> and then I just have some drinks in the back and I, you know, if some people come up to me, I'm like, you know, you probably shouldn't sit here. I'm in danger. <laughs> and then everybody gets super fucking freaked out. And then I just Uber to the next place. Just fuck with them and be like, no, I'm not. Uh, who's Ryan Rosilla? What's, what's the best place you've been, Ryan? Because you have been, at, I feel like, the most places out of any of us. Uh, I got to admit, I think Saint Tropez is the coolest place I've ever been in the world. And I've, been, you know, I, I was at a different place, you know, age wise when I went to the grill in Jamaica, but I fucking loved it because I loved how, and I mean this in the best way possible, but like it got real grimy and you could just, I had my own motorcycle and I would just roll up to these shacks and I love reggae. I fucking love the music so much. And people care would care more about like their speaker setup than literally any other possession they had house car pets like they cared about speakers and so i would just pull up to these shacks where it would just be stacks and stacks of speakers and you'd just be on some weird side road and i'd pull up and you know sit there and fucking the guys would just bring out 45s and play all this kind of music that I'd never heard before. I'd be writing it down, be like, this is amazing. And then I'd get on my motorcycle and like go to the next place. Uh, there was a couple of nights that got a little weird. I don't know that I'll ever share that story, <laughs> but that at least for my age and my mindset and the setup that I had and really loving the people of Jamaica, um, that I, I just, there's no way I could replicate that at 47 years old. Cause at 47, I'd be like, there's no fucking way I'm doing that deal again. Um, but uh, yeah, I went to Saint Tropez, the South of France. And what I loved about it is if you didn't know you were in France, right? If you just, whatever, like dropped in the middle of it, it's like, hey, guess where you are? You could say Spain, you could say Northern Italy, you might say France. Daytona because Beach. if you look at the history, yeah, if you, if you look at the history of kind of like who was, who was mingling with who based on who was winning some of these battles going back years and years and years ago. It was just a big melting pot of a lot of people. And so, you know, you're walking around the main village and guys are playing bocce at two in the morning and it's like a legit tournament and you just grab a beer and you're watching these old guys play and like everybody's going nuts. And then, yeah, there's the high end boat thing, which is cool. And the supper clubs go fucking crazy uh, and I wasn't even, I didn't even know if I would have gotten into one of the supper clubs. Certainly a, Hey, just one, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and we're talking like full blown Vegas 
show tunes, but you can see it as you walk by it. So you'd have to bring a group. I, you know, nobody would go by themselves, although maybe I should have tried to break that trend. But to go to that um, Club 55 thing where, you know, again, it can sound a little trendy of like Bridget Bardot and all these actors and actresses that went out to this part of the south of France and make it really trendy. But this is the part where I love Europe because we're so fucking uptight in the United States and you don't understand it. Like going to F1 in Mexico City and seeing like everybody just be like, yeah, this is another international Super Bowl for this this sport that America's just figuring out what a big deal it is. We want it to be the best time ever. We don't we're not worried about fucking with everybody. Like, do you have your pass? You don't have your pass. Like the way the Super Bowl plays out versus like some of this international stuff that I've been to now. I don't know, like maybe we're doing it wrong all the time. So to finish the point is I'm at this beach club in Saint Tropez and at six o'clock, the guy's like, hey, I got to take the chair. And I'm like, God damn it. Like I paid 50 bucks for this chair and I'm just kind of settling in. The sun isn't going to set until like after nine o'clock, the time of the year that I was there. I just cracked open my JP Morgan, Ron Chernow book. And the guy's like, you can stay as late as you want. And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, and most people just leave because the beach club is closed and the bar is closed and the restaurant's closed and whatever. He's like, if you are cool, he's like, you can fucking stay here the rest of the night. I was like, are you serious? So for two nights in a row, I just hung out at that beach club and watched the sunset and then walked all the way up the beach into like another village and like found a place to eat and all that kind of stuff. So even though I'm in one of the trendiest, most touristy places ever, there's still these these moments where you feel like it's so relaxed because it's Europe. And look, I, I'm telling you, if you do have a girlfriend or a wife, it's also even, it would probably be better with them, a little rosé and watching the sunset on this beach. I couldn't believe they let me stay there. And when I came back the next night, the guys were like, hey, man. And I was like, am I good again? And they're like, no problem. So, yeah, I've done the Amalfi thing. I've done Switzerland. I've done Germany. I've done parts of France. I've done Jamaica. I've done most of the islands. Um, you know, I haven't done any South America I'd like to go to Japan at some point, but uh, Saint Tropez is at the top of the list. Okay. So, so I love that. I love that this question. The first answer was medieval times. Yeah, and, it evolved, <laughs> and then we we eventually got to Saint Tropez, go to the south of yeah. France. Well, mine was an activity. Yeah, that, that was, was too long. That was part of the question. No, was activity? Yeah, was I feel no, like it wasn't. It wasn't too just the the to start where PFT was like Dave and Buster. Yeah, was oh, my that, favorite. That's <laughs> number two. Great. That's number two. Great. 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 <laughs> but also great. still, it was like south of France. Definitely. I, my my favorite vacation. My actual favorite vacation was the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador Ooh. and it is it's the it's the most unique place on earth that you can go to I want to go back every time I plan a vacation I'm like I just can I just go back to the turtles again that was that was a cool vacation but it's no kidding it's so great because you you arrive there and the they limit however many people can come visit at a given time you're not allowed to move there it's all local people and the only way you can move there is if you marry somebody that is a resident of the Galapagos Islands and so it's like still very, very Sounds small. Sounds like California. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's very, it's very small and it's a tight knit community, but you get there and everybody at some point works in the tourism business or the uh, conservation business. So you get like assigned a guide that will walk you around the island, take you to all these little beaches. First afternoon, we just got there. I, I walk out onto this beach. He hands me a snorkel and fins. He's like, okay, dive into the water. There's some sea lions that are swimming around. They're going to, they're going to want to play with you. I was like, what? So I just jump in the water. It's perfectly clear. And this fucking sea lion starts swimming up to me and he's like trying to get me to play. And I'm like, I think this is like a dog. It's like a dog in the water. And he, no joke, brings a, uh, a sea cucumber. It looks like a little dog toy. And he comes up to me. He's got the sea cucumber. And it's almost like he wants me to take it out of his mouth. And I'm like, I'm not going to touch this thing. It's like 150 pounds. It can make me drown. And then he takes it and then he like drops it over his own shoulder and then he goes and plays fetch with it and brings it back to me. And at that moment, I was like, this is the best place that I've ever been in my life. I'm playing, I'm playing fetch it's like a Disney kind of movie. with the sea lion. Yeah. It was incredible. Nemo. And then you get to go see these giant tortoises walking around everywhere. The beers are just like the most simple but most refreshing beer that you'll ever have in your life. Yeah, I just want to go back. I want to go back to the Galapagos. Wow. Plus, you, you actually, you sneaky learn a lot about science and about nature while you're there. Because everything, they name everything after Darwin on that island like <laughs> if darwin ever gets canceled they're gonna have a lot of stuff to tear down in the, in the galapagos islands uh but yeah i just i, I just want to go back to ecuador man uh i i think i gotta go to the galapagos now um all right couple other quick hitters underrated sporting event to attend in person we've got we've i would say collectively we've probably been to a lot like lucky enough to be in a lot of fucking cool places uh the world cup in qatar 
Yeah. It was fantastic. Specifically the, guitar. The Amir did a great job hosting the world. Uh, I know, but I'd, I'd say like a soccer game, an international soccer game between two countries that actually care about soccer mm-hmm. is awesome to go to. That are like passionate, fired up, at the brink of fighting yeah, each other. Of- when I was when I was living in Columbus, the uh, the the World Cup qualifier against Mexico was there all the, every four years, I guess it would be, um, and that was in that tiny little stadium in Columbus, Ohio. They usually play it in the fall, where it'd be cold as shit, so the Mexicans uh, would would not want to you know warm up, and they'd be losing their mind at how cold it is. That atmosphere was awesome. That atmosphere is like one of the coolest sporting atmospheres I've ever seen, and it was in like a tiny soccer stadium in in Ohio. Yeah. It was, it was sick. What about you or Saul? A fight. Oh, yeah. UFC. In Vegas. Yeah, or boxing. I mean, I've been to a couple big ones when I was younger. It is unlike any energy I've ever been around. Yep. Uh, I'm not saying it's better, but it's different because there's like a tension. There's this fucking insane tension that's different than, you know, big time college football tension, playoff baseball. Because all that tension, like, you know, I've been to some – some Red Sox games in 03 and 04 where like the tension in Fenway against the Yankees and that kind of stuff was pretty crazy, but it's a different cause you're almost like a little afraid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've been to some fights in Vegas in the early two thousands where depending on who was fighting and what the crowd was like and whether or not you're staying in the fight hotel and you lead up to it and there's this massive amount of tension and then it's fun to bet it and then it's over and if it was like a great fight, the energy like goes in a different direction, but goes to another level. And then it's just kind of a free for all in the fight casino if it's a good casino. Because then everybody who was just in the fight is like all hanging out and walking around, and you're running into everybody. I used to go all the time. I I definitely miss that. Yeah, Draymond Green. That's remember a great that? one. Yeah, Draymond Green assaulted me coming out of McGregor Mayweather. But that that's a good one. UFC. Uh, I went to a big fight at, at MSG. That's pretty sick too. Um, mm. and then I would say Rose Bowl. I Rose, Bowl's Rose awesome. Bowl. I did my first one this year. Rose Bowl is so. Was, it's just something about it. It's New Year's. It's everything. It's the sunset. It's just like people are in a good mood. It's just even if your team's not in it, it's just a like. It's just a beautiful that backdrop. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's something special. That backdrop stuff to be. Yeah, and then I was gonna say the other yeah. one. Um, obviously Baton Rouge on a Saturday night is yeah. unlike anything else. And then uh, off the maybe not off the beaten path, but uh, Keeneland uh, racetrack in Kentucky is they only race April and October. It is fucking awesome. It's, it's the Wrigley field Fenway park of race of horse racing. If you ever want to go for a weekend with your boys, that's, I would put that at the top of the list. I want to shout out the Maui Invitational as well. Oh, yeah. yeah because I, I think everyone thinks of the Maui Invitational as uh, being awesome just because of where it's at. So, like, if the appeal of going to the Maui Invitational would be to go to Maui, obviously. But if they put that gym anywhere in, on planet Earth, it would still be just an insane atmosphere. Like, the atmosphere actually inside the I get more excited. Every time I go to the Maui Invitational, I get more excited for what happens inside the gym than outside. It, it's, it doesn't make any sense, but... Uh, a, a gym that small, like the the energy this year when Arkansas was playing Creighton in the Mountain yep. Invitational, I swear to God, it was the loudest I've ever heard a basketball gym in my life, and it was Arkansas Creighton in Maui. Um, so shout out to shout out to Maui. That's a good one. To uh, to Rosillo's point about the Super Bowl being like you know it's it's not the same as other major international sporting events. It's it does feel it's super corporate. It's not the same type of fans at a game. I would I would actually love it if the NFL just let a home team host the Super Bowl every year and had the actual like organic energy from the fans in the crowd. I don't know how you determine that. I don't know that you could plan it. Yeah. We're also going the opposite way because you know, the NFL, they were hoping that they would get that game in Atlanta for the uh, AFC championship game. Cause I could totally see the yeah. NFL doing that oh, in the future. It's never in a million years going to happen. Yeah. But it, how cool would it have been to see? Wait, Oh yeah. I'm saying yeah. the championship oh, games, great. I wouldn't be shocked if the championship yeah, no, you're games right. become neutral right, site right. in the next like five, 10 which, years, which I hate. I mean, it, it doesn't feel the same when you're going into a super bowl. It, it feels it's a, it's such a sanitized version of watching a football game that it doesn't even feel like the sport sometimes. Yeah. Agreed. Well, there, there's no major sport that it's owner group gives less of a fuck about fans than the NFL. Yeah. Um, you know, I get that it's about maximizing, the dollar, but like to look at some of the flex scheduling thing where you're supposed to then what change your plans last minute now. Like, have you seen some of this yeah, stuff? It's crazy. So, I, 
Um, I got. Uh, you're right. They're probably going to yeah. do it. They're probably going to do more neutral site stuff. Like at first, it's like, oh, cool, the draft is going everywhere, and then you're like, wait, just because you can charge for it yeah. now. So I, I don't know. The, the NFL, I get maximizing every dollar that you can make, but I think the NFL usually takes it to a level where you start going like, dude, is it is it this important? Yeah, like, they're also doing. It's very, it's very clear what they're doing with the draft is they're basically sending it to all the cities that won't have Super Bowls. So be like, well, you had the draft when they were like Green Bay. It's like, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, one last one, and this is this is more of a like true sickos, but. If you can ever find yourself in a matching game on a Tuesday or Wednesday night, it is something special because it's like you're watching Division One college football and there's like, you know, a thousand people and it's just the play is funny and it's like, and and some of the stadiums I know funny how Northern Illinois you can go you can leave the stadium back to your car to drink at halftime and then go back in the stadium like it's just. There's something special. I, we used to be able to do that at Oregon. Really? Then Eugene, yeah. Have you guys gone to Eugene for a no, game? No, I haven't. I'll, I know it's just it's yeah. such a pain in the ass. Have you been, Titus? No, I was gonna go to the Ohio State uh, game up there, and then COVID ruined it, and and yeah, it blew it. So um, I've not been. When it's when it's rolling, I I would actually put Oregon up there with a lot of places I've been. So. Uh, but you know, now it's just turning into a conversation about what was something cool you did. <laughs> yeah, all right. So, uh, I, would like, I would like to go to a game in Boone, North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, that yes. seems like a great place yes. to watch a football game. Yes, absolutely. Um, all right, last one because we're, we we've been running long. Uh, Roback question: R H O B A C K dot com. Use code Take for twenty percent off your first purchase. Q zips, polos, hoodies, joggers. Uh, code Take for twenty percent off your first purchase. Uh, we were going to do Mount Rushmore. We could just say. What our number one, like, we feel like we're getting old thing. We could just do that and wrap it up with that. A group Mount Rushmore? Yeah, group Mount Rushmore. So everyone has one pick, can can explain, you know, hmm. what what what's the thing that you, you look at and you're like, fuck, I am getting old. Hmm. All right. Why don't we just go rapid fire? All right, let's fire. go rapid fire. Like, you're, right, you're right. Just rapid we're fire. Just, we can rapid right. fire. Every one All of right. us, a pack to right. not, okay. and I'm talking about All myself right. here, a pack to not explain. All right. Titus, yeah. Rosillo, PFT, myself. We'll do that order, and then we'll come back. Okay, uh, I'll start. No, uh, number one on my list was actually considering going to the doctor when when you feel oh, something, uh -huh. something wrong. Yes. Like, like you don't. I still don't go to the doctor, yes. but I, I still don't. But it actually it crosses my mind for like as I've gotten a little older, I'm like, should I go to the doctor? Yeah. Um, and that was something I never ever thought about. You're like this ever. could be serious. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, this could be serious, and then. I wait a few days and it's fine, but uh, yeah, that's a great. One. Actually, considering going to that, yeah, home. just e just even the thought, even the thought that creeps just in your the head. The thought, yes, the thought alone. I feel like I'm I'm 90 years old by even thinking. Yeah. That. All right, Rosillo. Um, my first pick was going to be opening mail, <laughs> but I think I think I should change it to excited to open Ooh. mail. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. That's a very good one. I wonder what this could be. I wonder who. <laughs> yes. Because I had a stack of stuff. The stack of stuff. I was not excited, but I was like, look at me opening this shit. Yeah. Another tax refund, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or Bill. All right, PFT. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take an, an easy one right off the bat. When a player who's younger than you retires from a sport. Mm -hmm. Yes. That was that was a moment. Where I was yeah, like, LeBron retiring is going to suck. It's going to ruin my world. Yeah. Shit, LeBron! Yeah, Steve, LeBron running out of gas against Denver was already like an ex triggered an existential crisis for me. Like watching him be too old to finish. Yeah, it's his foot, dude. It'll be like, fine. Oh, the, uh, right. the 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 cousin of that is like looking up ages of like Barry Bonds is fifty eight years old. I'm like, fuck. Are you serious? Oof. Like, what? How's Barry Oof. Bonds gonna be sixty soon? That makes no sense. Oof. That sucks. Um, that's good. Yeah, one. like Van Gundy was like 34 when he got the Knicks job, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> yeah. like the pod's yeah. doing all yeah. right, but still. <laughs> um, all right, mine, mine's an easy first one, too, uh, and it actually is starting to happen to me. Uh, I, I have had to ask people to turn down the music at, like, bars or uh, – <laughs> actually, Stanford Steve can back this up. We are at an Army-Navy tailgate, and I literally couldn't hear what other people were saying, and I had to tell DJ, can you just turn it down a little bit? And I was like, holy fuck, this is brutal. But it happened, and it sucks. It's brutal. Um, 
Have you guys had to do it? <laughs> I've not had to do it. I've wanted. I've no. wanted to do it. Oh. I'd leave yeah. before I'd I admit just to leave. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just Listen, leave. No I got to a point where it's like I can't hear. I have to ask them to turn it down. Um, PFT. When we were in, when we were in Scottsdale, uh, we went to the Barstool Bar after the dozen yeah. deal, and uh, I, I we talked about it the day after. But I I Grandpa Simpson that shit. We walked right <laughs> in the and the, the music was so, so loud. loud. I just turned yes. around, walked right back yes. out. Um, that- yeah. That first moment where you're like, fuck, this music is loud. It's just this sucks. Is so loud. Sucks. I, went, yeah. I went upstairs. I looked at the table. I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to hear anybody. They're not going to be able yeah. to hear me talk. What? What's the upside to me staying in this club right now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then, and then I, I say to myself, uh, why would, why would this, why would the Barstool Bar do this? Like, th- this is fucking miserable. No one enjoys this. And then I look out, and there's a line around the block of people waiting to get in. And I was like, Yeah. All right. I guess it's a me yeah. problem. Mm-hmm. I guess it's. Not a- <laughs> um. And the other one is is because uh, working at Barstool, we're with a lot of younger people. Just names of actors or actresses and like tiktok stars and you're like that person's been around for five years and it literally is a blank like a complete blank there was one dave was telling me something about what what's the the miami girl uh alex alex wren sheena easton alex wren alex earl Earl. they told me about her in uh i think we're in houston and i was like i don't i've never heard that name in my life and then they're like how have you not she has like 35 million followers and i was like fuck yeah so but the but then the, the other part of that is because the, the, when you're in the transition part of feeling old you you're like shit how do i not know that and then you like want to figure it out but when you're truly old is when you hear that and you just shrug your shoulders and you're like i don't give a shit i'm not gonna like yeah. I'm gonna, i don't mm-hmm. not only not only do i not know who she is i don't care moving forward i don't even care to like look into it this one you I'm should look with, into like, not being cool i'll just say that oh, really? <laughs> i did look into this one and I do follow her on all platforms now. <laughs> <laughs> you're a fan of her work. <laughs> right, a- Drop her a line. Let her know you're a fan. Yeah, you that know? could change her life, big that. cat. Like, that dude, could change her life. Dude, I, w- side tangent, but uh, Glenny Balls has a great show at Barstool Sports called uh, Only Stands. So sometimes he has OnlyFans models. Sometimes he has porn stars. I did go up to one of the porn stars and I was like, I'm a big fan of your work. And I never oh, have Jesus. felt like a bigger loser in my entire life. <laughs> But also, she like oh, no. smiled at me, and I was like, "That rocked." <laughs> oh, no. uh, I don't know if this one counts as the same as what Big Cat just said. You can you can vote me down if it does. Just watching any award show Ooh. doesn't matter what award show it is. If it's uh, the MTV, I think it the VMAs, if it's the Grammys, especially the Grammys, I feel like that's the bad one. Yep. The Oscars is one I can still watch and be like, okay, I know because most of those people are so old, anyways. But watching the Grammys, I'll, that that will be mine. Yeah, because I like that. I have zero idea who any of these people are. Yes, yes. Plays in well. Good, good transition. Uh, my so I'm up here. Yep, yep. You just ruined the transition. The weird thing is, is you could also go just look at your grammar. I wrote down in our categories Titus R R P F T, and then Big Cat said me, and I wrote me. That's not a great <laughs> sign. It's actually Big Cat. I wrote me. I'm like, wait, did I just go? Uh, I'm going to say anytime you start a question with, did you know that in World War II, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Reading a ton of nonfiction books on a beach. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, that That's definitely yeah. happened. I was reading uh, Hitler and Stalin. It's a book about Hitler and Stalin on the beach in Cabo. And everybody around me was reading like some romance novel or like the latest mystery novel. And I'm like, I'm very old looking around here. Like I'm, I'm very interested in what happened on board the submarine. <laughs> we, we're st- I'm, I'm in this, uh, I'm in that part one of the, the African, um, like occupation there where Patton's just telling guys, if I see you walking back towards camp, I'm going to shoot you. Mm-hmm. And like it's fucking it's awesome, but I mean when we went to see Shane I was Dillis gonna in say, Arizona, <laughs> and, and he's like, you know, my dad's not a real conservative, but he's like on his way. He's reading a lot of military fiction or a lot of military <laughs> yes. nonfiction, and, and Big Cat's like elbowing the <laughs> shit out of me, being like, "You're such a conservative. You're such a conservative." He was talking directly to Russell. He's like, "Yeah, I'm not Republican, yeah. but I am getting into history." <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Like I don't want, I don't want society to just abandon the people that need the help the most. But I'm in the middle of this Vietnam book. It's fucking killer. <laughs> it, where, where does World War One fit into this in terms of like old people's interests? Like if you're if you're interested in World War One more so than two, does that mean you're 
and older. I think you feel. Does that I think make you two. I think not? two is the gateway to one. Two. Yeah. Two, two is yeah, the gateway like, yeah. drug. Two is like a basic bitch totally. history yeah. move. It, yeah. It's like everybody at some point gets into World War Two. It's good. It's going to happen yeah. to you if it hasn't already. And then the people that really lean into that that are like, well, I want to learn more about World War Two. Are there more World Wars? Yeah. I yeah well, no. Like, yes, the are. reason people learn about World War One is because they want to know more about World War Two. It's like how that happens. Yeah. yeah. yeah how did this point. guy start doing point. hard drugs? Let's see his days when he was smoking <laughs> that's, weed. That's yeah. It's a, a great point. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I love I love that you guys are bringing this up because I eventually was like, all right, I'm really lean in my World War One years. Let me get some of the build up. Like sometimes <laughs> yeah. I'll read about the wars and then I'll be like, I want to prequel yeah. it. Yeah. You know, not to say that two is Godfather two and one is Godfather one, even though most of us like two better. But I remember like the first time reading about the buildup of one, and I was like, "Man, Germany's got some really flimsy arguments." Here. <laughs> <laughs> and what? They, they were they were like, "Why does everyone love French culture so much more than ours?" Be like, "How long do you have?" <laughs> also, the ending of World War Two is better. They found a way to tie that one up very neatly at the end. That's true. The That's first true. one yeah. had a lot of That's hanging the... plot points. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Can you imagine if they just did one World uh -huh. War One? That should have been their first cue. Uh, was like this. Maybe this war wasn't ended correctly because we called it World War One. <laughs> All right, you're oh, the, you're the other thing too. The other the other thing I found interesting about World War Two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. All right, you're two. Is that Stalin? <laughs> Stalin was very upset because the losses on the Eastern Front were monumental compared to the Allied yeah. troops. And so then, when Hollywood started making movies after the end of World War Two, Stalin and Russians were offended that. They felt like they were afterthoughts in the story. Just like, wait, so you thought these movies in Hollywood were going to end with a bunch of guys with Russian names and accents as the heroes of movies in the late forties and early fifties? Like, come on, dude, that's not how L.A. works. And when we do, we're going to have Jude Law play the main character, and he's going to he's going to speak English. Yeah. <laughs> uh, God damn. All right, Titus, you have two. Uh, I got two. Uh. Ch -ch -ch uh, all right, my second one is watching a game and having very, very strong opinions on the jersey. Yeah, um, that's, I've, I've not, not even, not even. My mine is less like whether the jerseys are cool and more about the colors. Like, uh, we're recording this right after Game One of the NBA yep. Finals, and the the moment the game was tipped off, and the Heat are wearing their dark red, and the Nuggets are wearing their dark blue. I was just like, I can't watch yes. this. Someone, someone needs to be wearing white. Yes, and that I feel like that is this. This is something I complain about all the time, and everybody looks at me like I'm 100 years old. But I swear to God, I'm right that this is insane. I complained about the same shit. I NBA has completely ruined their jersey setups. It's ridiculous. Yeah. There was that game yeah. like two years ago where the the Heat were basically wearing the Pacers uniforms in a playoff yeah. game, and I was like, what the fuck is going on? This yeah. this is bad, but the cut like just literally it hurts my eyes to watch two dark color or two like I need one light one dark, uh, mm -hmm. make it make it. You know. <laughs> All right, next pick. <laughs> so easy to understand. Uh, moving on <laughs> before we. Uh, my third one is buying two of something because you like it so much, and you don't even need yes. to. You just buy one. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do with shoes yeah, all you, the time. You yeah. find one. Yeah, That's shoes. Awesome. Yeah. You buy two pairs because you're like, if this wears out, I want to have another one to use. And I don't trust that the same model in three years, like they're going to tweak it. So it's not going to be the exact fit like I like. So I'm just going to go ahead and buy two. So that way when it's time to, to exchange, I don't have to go buy a new one and, and take a chance that it's the same. Yes. You know? mm -hmm. Yes. So. <laughs> okay. That's a great one. Uh, Rosillo. Uh, seeing IG videos and then texting them to your Friends threads. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's that old. I do. When I do it with you and Chris Long and I don't get any feedback, I'm like, oh, you're getting fucking old. Send him a bad video. <laughs> what are you supposed Dude, to do? Like, not, not sure. Because I think when you get older, you're like, oh my God, that was funny. Have these guys seen it? Let me share it with them. And because I'm older than you guys, it gets, it gets my, I'm like, oh, not oh. much. Not much reaction to that. Must have seen do you, those guys. Do you add? Do you add context though? No. Do you add commentary, or do you just send that, the link? Because that can be confusing. Yeah. He'll send the link, send and it won't yeah. be a follow up, so I won't know, like wh which vibe are we going for here? Yeah, are we right. Ripping him? Right. Oh, do we think it was cool? <laughs> oh, so you're, you think I'm so cool that you don't want to bum me out by saying the wrong? I don't thing, want. I don't like, want to. Hey, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't want to change the vibe where you're like, if if it's like, a, hey, this. That's Can you great. believe this guy's an idiot? That's, like, 
That yeah, right. What if Rosillo thinks this guy's cool and I say idiot? <laughs> yeah, lay out, right, lay right, out. Right. This is the coolest. This is the coolest I felt literally in 2023. <laughs> so thanks. Uh, all right, PFT. All right, um, mine's very specific to to me in particular. But uh, when I heard Creed on a classic rock channel, I <laughs> lost my shit. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm no, I'm 13. I'm 13. This song is popular. This is arms wide open. This is a banger. This is mainstream. This is modern rock. Do not put this on classic rock 94.7. That's not where this belongs. It belongs on DC 101, not classic rock. And then I, I also heard uh, Dave Matthews band Oof. on classic rock. That's, that sucks to think about. That's tough. That alternative tough. music. Yeah. We, we can do that thing with time where we're like, we are uh, like, yeah. Dave Matthews band Crash came out probably 1995, so about 18 years ago. We're as far removed as Crash by Dave Matthews Band as when we were growing up, we were from like Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin. Yeah, like 1983 oh, no. is closer to World War II than it is to today. Fuck time, man. No. Yeah. yeah, I love when people thought that was super interesting, though. <laughs> like, today is yeah. closer to, and you're like, yeah, now we got it. Yeah, yeah. Got I think we should all start doing stuff like that didn't happen, where it's like "I love you, man" came out thirty years ago today. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> Holy shit! Time's Holy flying. Shit. Yeah. Um, all right, my last two. Uh, uh, my next pick is going to be getting actually upset when a game doesn't tip off when it says it's going to tip off. Um, <laughs> I used to joke about it, but now it's like. If it says like 8.30 and they tip off at 8.43, I'm like, what the fuck? Why did you fucking tell? Like, that's another 13 minutes that I'm not going to be in bed. Like, this is bullshit. Don't fucking tell me 8.30 and then tip off at 8.43. And I know it's very stupid to get mad about it, but I get mad about it. That's yeah. a good one. Espe yeah, especially when one. it's the, those very specific times. That, yeah. That'll fuck you up. It's like, yeah, you said you 837. Promised. You said 837 <laughs> yeah. for a reason. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, just just having an opinion on the time that games tip off is a sign. Of yes, gold. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're just, it just no matter just it, it, literally any opinion. We're like, why would they? Why would they tip it off at this time when this is? Yeah. Don't they know that this this and yeah. this? And, or like, yeah. yeah, there was an NHL during Game Seven of, uh, or maybe I can't remember, but it was like the NHL should have played their game in the afternoon. I'm like, why the fuck didn't they play in the afternoon? Like, why <laughs> why they do this? Um, yeah. And then the last one. This might be more of a dad thing, but I. I, I if you put me on a couch, I can nap like almost instantly for ten minutes, fifteen minutes. Like if I'm if I'm if I'm basically circulation. If thing. I'm basically seated or like in any comfortable position, and I'm a little bit tired, it's lights out so fast. And uh, I th I feel like you know growing up, you see your dad be able to do that, and like you're like, what the fuck? Like why is he napping? It's like four o'clock in the afternoon. Why is he taking a ten minute nap? And now I've gotten to that point, and it's like fuck, that is me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my last one? Yeah. Getting actually pissed off during a, a basketball game that they don't call carrying anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, calling players, doing like pointing at the TV and saying, that's a carry. Yeah. That's a that's carry. That, yeah. that was a moment for me where it's like, I am, I'm my dad at yeah. this point. I remember yeah. how mad he got when uh, when Allen Iverson was playing. Yeah. It's like, these are illegal. <laughs> these are all illegal moves that yeah. he's making right now. That The cousin of that one is, <laughs> is like, I actually do get mad when a player, like, could lay it up and they dunk instead and miss. And I'm like, fucking layup counts as two, yep. bro. Like, what are you doing? Go high glass. The players <laughs> yeah. should use the glass more. Yeah. If, the, if the Baseball Hall of Fame voters voted on the NBA Hall of Fame, James Harden would not make that. <laughs> because he's... Well... His step-backs okay are... Yeah, I was going to say, if yeah, Rosillo yeah. voted on it, he wouldn't make it in. <laughs> his step-backs... They'd, they'd be like, his step-backs are travels and the foul bait, all that yeah. stuff. He's not... Yeah. But, all right, Rosillo, your last pick. Okay, it's kind of... It's the same thing, but it's maybe different. It's getting horny at Jim slash <laughs> the older, less filtered cousin... Going to gym to get horny, which I think is an even older version of the first. Getting, because yeah. when I'm at the gym, and granted, you know, there's times, especially like where I live, you're like, holy shit. But I'm there for my reps, all right? I'm there to put the work in. But there's a few times you're like, oh, my God, like, look at her. But then there's that next level of guy who's like, hey, did you see her? You're like, yeah, I fucking saw her. She's gorgeous and everybody can see her. It's like, fucking A, bro. And then he's weird. 
And then the next version is like the guy that made been his day off. And he's just kicking some cardio around and he goes only to look at women. And that's that's a level I don't know that I'll ever get to. Who knows? They've, Maybe I will be. That's going to be you, dude. They, they've Who got knows? like three rows of treadmills and that guy goes to the back row. Every single time. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he knows yeah. what he's doing. Uh, all right, last pick. That's good. Uh, my, my last one is um, staring at the horizon at the beach. You're at the beach, and you're standing there, and you're just looking off in the horizon. This is something I notice when I go to the beach. Uh, dudes in their 20s are playing spike ball, and they're fucking throwing the football around. And then you'll just see, like, an old dude who's got his hands on his hips, and he's just looking off in the horizon. Dude. So good. I do it. Yeah. And you know what it is? Yeah. That, that is also the – if you ever caught yourself being like, you got to come check out this sunset. That's, yes, that's yeah. it right it's, there where you're like, it's, look like at this sunset. The sun is hiding yeah. and they can't just turn around yeah. and look at Come it. Come check yeah. this out. The only time. Walking, walking the only into time a room to announce to them, you should all be outside right now. Yeah. No, my mom's a big <laughs> like, come check out this sunset. It's incredible. It's like, yeah. well, it does set every day. I feel like if you're younger and you do this, it's a cry for help because you're like going through some shit and you want to like just go to the beach and stare in, 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 into the distance. But older dudes, it's just like a regular part of life. Like every time I go to the beach, I, I see the same guy. I started, I got to the point I was watching the old men watching the horizon. I'm like, what the fuck does this guy know? Like he looks like he's he's solving our, our great I, see, problems I think, in life. So. You know, look, uh, whatever dudes are doing to calm so step, but like I think the cool thing, like before I start reading, I'll go take a deep breath, look around a little bit, you know, fucking, <laughs> and I'm fine. I'm actually fine. Like I'm, I'm going to sit down and just being like, fucking soak it in for five minutes before you start cranking away on the cargo holds. You're doing, you're doing warm ups for reading, <laughs> getting the mind ready. Oh man. Um, all right. This has been great. My pre-workout. Yeah. Do you guys want to guess a number? Sure. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Let's guess yeah. numbers. Go I'll go we'll 69. Um, I'll go 17. What do you guys want to guess? Uh, I was going to guess 17. That's so fucking weird. Yeah. I'll do 27. Seven, Give me 22. 17 is Hank's number. 20 and what is yours, Memes? <laughs> 21. Oh, you guessed 20, yeah. didn't Max. you? Max. 22. Wow. Oh. Wow. All right. Max, you were one so away no one from being it. first place. That was exciting for a moment. I thought you got it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you, guys. One of you is going to have to have a kid to do another one of these. Nose game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we pre appreciate it. It is Friday and there's no games. <laughs> see what I can do. <laughs> these are always our favorite, though. So thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Love you guys. All right. All right. Thanks see you guys. guys. You're the best. Thank you. See ya.